And hello, everyone. This is James Lindsay. You are listening to the New Discourses podcast, and you are in the middle of my probably extraordinarily long, as I'm finding out, and evolving series on critical education theory, aka critical pedagogy, if you need a name for this monster. This, of course, is a series somewhat distinct from my Groomer Schools series, which I encourage you to check out. They are linked together in concept. In a sense, the Groomer School series is kind of telling you the end of the trajectory that I'm following in the Critical Education Theory series. I didn't do that on purpose. I just got pissed off about the groomers in the schools. So if you listen to those three episodes, and I'm getting extraordinarily strong positive feedback about those three, the Groomer School series on on the New Discourses podcast, you can hear about the Marxist attempt to use sexual education in the first episode uh, to achieve Marxist agendas in society. You can hear actual queer theory and what its purpose is and why they want it in early childhood education in elementary schools in the second episode. And in the third episode, you can hear how these things come together, in particular with critical race theory, to create a replication of Mao's educational program that he used to create the Red Guard in China in the 1960s and 1970s, which was a nightmare that led to the deaths of millions of people. This series, however, the critical education theory series or critical pedagogy series is a bigger project. And so I'll remind the listener that we're in the third episode of this now, that what we're actually tracking through is the, uh, as, as kind of like the guidepost. I'm actually taking this book very seriously. There's this book by an education theorist, at, if I recall correctly, at Iowa State University by the name of Isaac Gottsman. That's G-O-T-T-E-S-M-A-N. The book is called The Critical Turn in Education, and it uh, chronicles the history of the critical, th- the creeping in, or the incorporation of, or the, the colonization by critical theory throughout education. And so, it's a very useful resource. It's historical. It's theoretical at the same time. And this, like I said, is the third episode where I'm going through this book and taking the author seriously. The first episode, I read the series editor's introduction, which is by Michael Apple. Uh, we'll turn more to him sooner or later. Um, it's going to take a little while to get there, as you'll hear. But it lays out the new Marxist commitments very clearly. He he gives a list of something like nine commitments that education has to have going forward, this book being published in 2016, uh, but that are rooted in the critical theory tradition. And the second episode, to catch you up, I won't eventually won't be able to keep up with all of what all the episodes are about and summarize them at the beginning of these podcasts, because there's probably going to be like 30 of these or more. Um, But the second episode goes to the author's introduction to the book and points out, in particular, the most important thing I wanted to draw from that was that what we're dealing with when we say critical theory is, in fact, critical Marxism, and that critical Marxism had a deliberate turn into education starting particularly in the 1970s, where there was this evolution from what was the very radical new left coming out of the critical theory neo-Marxist school into what got called the academic left, And Gottsman is the first person I've seen that chronicles this really clearly. And so I wanted to bring that out. Pardon me. Still getting over whatever Turning Point USA coof I got uh, while I was there. Uh, Hopefully we won't do that too many times throughout the podcast. So that should catch you up. So, you know, as far as schools go and critical pedagogy goes, we're about five podcasts deep. Luckily, we don't need to know too much for this one. But it's going to become increasingly important that you understand a lot about what's going on with Marxian theology. And I'm not even really inclined to call it Marxian theory anymore, but Marxian theology. I need to do a proper podcast on that soon where I lay out what I see as the theological structure of Marxism. If you've listened to my nearly four hour long Hegel podcast, you've got some sense of some of the background for that. Uh I really need to dive into it very specifically. If you listen to some of the Marcusean stuff about whether it's solidarity, which will premiere or which we'll talk about today, it'll feature is the word I was looking for in today's podcast, solidarity being kind of this key. Uh, But if you listen to some of the other Marcusean stuff, you can get some more flavor. But I really need to put together 
a theology podcast about Marxist theology and Marcusean theology, or maybe two of them, that set even more context for how you need to understand this. As I've also talked in the past about how this is obviously a religious movement in wokeness, and increasingly thinking about this as an underlying theology underneath the movement is going to be so crucial to understanding what's actually going on. So there's a lot of background if you're just kind of coming in and this is your first introduction either to the series or to the podcast, you know, bless your heart because I'm telling you, there's a lot of background here to catch up to. There's no easy, quick way to summarize any of this stuff. Um, But that said, we're going to dive right in. I want to call this episode of the podcast, you know, this critical pedagogy episode three, the politics of education and a new hope. And this is really why that theology stuff is going to become relevant because despair and hope are going to be the kind of big themes here uh, and how those are seen from the critical perspective. So like I said, in the previous two episodes of this podcast, and I won't be able to keep doing these summaries, covered the editor's introduction, the author's introduction to this book, The Critical Turn in Education by Isaac Gottsman. When I say I'm taking the author at his word, now I'm going to kind of summarize what I mean by that. Gottsman tells us that the best way to read this book, and I've read the book all the way through two or three times now, I have to check, and I'm reading through it again. I've read the first few chapters a bunch of times because I keep meaning to read them. I write, read frequently on airplanes when I can't sit down at the microphone anytime soon necessarily. And so I read them and then I think, oh, I'm getting too far ahead. I got to like back up and I can't remember. But I've read chapters, the, the introductions in chapters one and two any number of times. And what Gottsman recommends is as you read through the book, He brings up all these other sources that were significant in the critical turn in education. He says to read them in parallel. Well, some of those I've read, some of those I am reading, some of those I have not read. And so I'm trying to do a metric ton of reading on top of reading through this one book. But I am going to take the author, uh, Gottsman, very much at his word. And as a matter of fact, we're barely going to get out of the first paragraph of the first chapter (laughs) of Gottsman's book, because we're going to follow his instructions and we're going to follow the rabbit trail into some other books, or actually one other book today, which we're not even going to get out of the introduction of. Uh, and then eventually this this chapter is particularly concerned with kind of the the super text of critical pedagogy, the pedagogy of the oppressed by Paulo Freire, which we will end up spending in ent- doing an entire sub-series on uh, when we get to it. But it looks like I'm going to have to do a sub-series first on a different book by Freire um, titled uh, The Politics of Education, which is what we're going to dive into the introduction to today. Um, I can't just read these books to you, though. Like, you know, I read these Marcusean essays to you, and I read the um, Combahee River Collective Statement. I read some of Crenshaw's papers. I read the Crazy Queer Theory paper. I can't just keep reading this stuff. This would be way too long. Um, probably would violate copyright or something if I just read the book. But instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to summarize what Got- Gottsman is trying to say. And like I said, we're not going to get very far today in the critical turn of edu- in education. So you can understand what this critical turn in education looked like, how it happened, who was involved, and what commitments it rearranges education to uphold instead of, say, educating. Um, just to remind you that the book carries as a subtitle this idea that the uh, critical turn in education went in three kind of turns of the ratchet, if we want to use that metaphor, uh, three major steps. The first is Marxist critique, and then that gave way. So it's the first portion of the critical turn in education was the introduction of Marxist critique into education, into education, uh, into to critique education itself in Marxian terms. Secondly, and way down the track for us, post-structural feminism comes into the picture. That's basically the incorporation of postmodernism as the feminists in America garbled it. Uh, so it's kind of how queer theory and gender theory got kind of their entrance. But most importantly, that's where standpoint epistemology became core to education. And then the third piece, the third turn of the ratchet, he mentions is critical race theory, which of course we're told is not an education, even though it's literally listed as one of the three major things that caused a critical turn in education in the book titled The Critical Turn in Education. And even though there was a paper written by Gloria Ladson Billings and William Tate IV, who are, Gloria Ladson Billings is very prominent in educational policy and activism right now still to this day. In 1995, they wrote a paper that was very famous and influential called Toward a Critical Race Theory of Education, but it's not in our schools because they lie. All they do is lie. So we had to do that again. 
So I'm going to try to dip into these landmark sources, though, and go through. And today we're going to get not very far because we're going to dive into this Freire nonsense. So chapter one in Gottsman's book is called Revolutionary Moments. Sorry, Movements. I don't know how I got moments in my head, but I typed it out in my notes like 30 times and I had to go back and fix it and I cannot get it out of my head now. Chapter one is titled Revolutionary Movements. And it's actually about Paulo Freire. Now, this is very interesting to summarize Gottsman's argument in kind of a big picture because we're going to get lost in his weeds real fast. To summarize his argument about Freire, Freire is largely and widely considered to be the father of critical pedagogy. He is the guy. And if you have started to dip your toes into what's happened in the schools, you probably think Paulo Freire is the guy. Now, I can't ever say his name right. I can spell it. F-R-E-I-R-E, -E, Freire, I believe. He's a Brazilian Marxist. And he's widely credited with having brought literacy to the peasants of Brazil. He's credited that way by Marxists um, because his program really sucks and it really failed. It was actually using an adult literacy program for the peasants as an excuse to teach them Marxism. And this has just been a disaster all around. Uh <clears throat> Eventually, what we're going to do is we're going to go through his kind of Ur text, which is uh, from 1970, I think republished significantly in 1972, called uh, The Pedagogy of the Oppressed. But um, and that's his magnum opus. But before we get to that, we're going to kind of like break down what Gottsman says about him. And Gottsman says, you're wrong to think of Freire as the father of critical pedagogy, because in fact, he wasn't. And in fact, he, or he catalogs in this chapter very effectively that it, even though Pedagogy of the Oppressed was written in 1970, and even though there was lots of critical education stuff starting in even the 1960s, but certainly through the 1970s, which he refers to, which we'll see as we're going to refer to, he doesn't refer to it, but another guy, Henry Drew, refers to it as the new sociology of education. Um, even though all this stuff was going on through the 60s and or the late 60s and the 70s and even the early 80s, Drew being very prominent by 1980, 1981, um, Freire was more or less unknown and, and irrelevant to critical pedagogy or radical pedagogy or leftist education or whatever you want to term it, critical education theory, until at least 1985. And so you've got 15 years of Freire's magnum opus that's now like the Ur text of critical pedagogy that's in every teaching school. Everybody is at least supposed to revere it if they don't actually read it. I've heard that a lot of them don't actually read it. A lot of education students aren't actually made to read it, but they all know what it is. It is the also the third most cited. So being cited, by the way, is a big deal in academia, but it is the third most cited work in the humanities in existence, is the pedagogy of the oppressed. So this book has had unbelievable influence, unbelievable uh, impact. But Gottsman's telling us that it was 15, 16 years after it was published before it started to have any impact, at least in North America. And so if we think of him as the father of critical pedagogy, we actually miss all the developed, to kind of use some bookmark dates between 1968 and say 1985. 1986. So you're talking almost 16, 18 years in which critical pedagogy was already developing in that Marxist critique in the critical Marxist vein. And then you have this character he documents later in the book of Henry Giroux, who discovers and connects with Freire's work, brings him into the North American context under very peculiar circumstances. And then kind of history gets rewritten around this, that Freire was the first big guy writing the first big thing and the, the everything was all about that. And he really was that influential, but it would be, as Gottsman puts it, completely incorrect and to miss what's actually going on to say that Freire is the beginning of critical pedagogy in at least the North American context. And in fact, it wasn't called critical pedagogy until it was called critical pedagogy in the North American context by people like Henry Giroux. So this is an interesting piece of history that, that Freire's impact certainly cannot be diminished or ignored. And he is the third most cited work in the humanities and social sciences in the history of scholarship. And he is unabashedly Marxist, etc. But there's this 
other kind of almost 20 year old tradition of radical education theory or leftist education theory or really critical Marxist education theory that had been developing largely off of the back of the neo Marxist tradition. So all of this crap where Marcuse and I've talked about Herbert Marcuse from the 1960s, I've talked about him a billion times, um, was saying that we have to have a student movement and all of the radicals that he was looking at, the outsiders, the weather underground and so on, all end up stop. They all stop being violent radicals in the streets in the early 1970s and they all go into K through 12 education and pre-service teacher education and colleges of education. Uh, all of that. It was already, it's so significant and laid this groundwork. And in fact, it builds the bridge from neo-Marxism to wokeism. That's not just the one that we talked about when I did the podcast on the true history of intersectionality, uh, which was the, the true history of intersectionality being that which came out of the Combahee River Collective being the link between Marcusa and Crenshaw. But what we're going to see here is that Freire creates another bridge that in the 80s, comes up. The idea, Freire had this idea that all all oppression is interlocked and interlinked. And he wasn't reading, you know, he wasn't, he wasn't reading the Combahee River collective statement that didn't come out for seven more years when he, when he was saying that stuff. And so anyway, there's this argument though, that, that is so important is that in some sense, what we're going to see Freire as is the kind of like spiritual leader, and I really do mean that, of critical education theory or critical pedagogy, but he's not the father of the movement. And that's going to be located in Henry Giroux, who we'll get to, I think he's like chapter four of this book. And the way it's going, we're never going to get there because I've got like a hundred podcasts just to get through chapter one. So anyway, Gottsman doesn't begin by talking about Freire's, the, the first chapter is about Freire and his impact. He does not begin by talking about the magnum opus, the Pedagogy of the Oppressed from 1970. Instead, and we will do a whole series going through each chapter of that book, four chapters, it'll be at least four podcasts, it might end up being six or eight. But what he does instead is he takes us right from the beginning, Gottsman takes us into the winter 1985 issue of the Harvard Educational Review, which is abbreviated HER, H-E-R. Harvard Educational Review. And there's a, he, he takes us to this article. I looked it up. It's only been cited five or six times. It's really it depends on which source you're looking at. Some sources say it's only been cited twice. Some sources say it's been cited, I think Google Scholar says five times. Very not influential in terms of its citation count. But there was a book review published in 1985 in the Harvard Education Review by a education scholar activist by the name of Martha Montero. Seabirth. I think that's how you spell it, say the last name. Montero, it's hyphenated. Uh, but Montero is the first before the hyphen, after the hyphen. S E I S I E B U R T H. Seabirth, I think. So she pu published a short review. It's only six pages long. I actually was able to dig up part of it, but not the whole thing without having to pay for it. So I haven't read the whole thing of, on my own. But he did, she did a short review of a different book by Freire that came out in 1985, which is, I mentioned, The Politics of Education, Culture, Power, and Liberation. So that book came out in 85. She did this review of it. A few people paid attention to her review. One of them happens to be Isaac Gottsman. One of the five citations located on Google Scholar is, in fact, his book. And he starts out chapter one by pointing out the role of Harvard Education Review, and in particular, this 1980, this review of this 1985 book. And we're going to read a little bit from that in a second. In fact, we're going to read the first paragraph of this chapter, which goes there. Um, but first, I want to give a little historical context to 1985. So critical race theory is happening, but hasn't really been codified yet. This is pre-critical race theory. Um, there's a lot of radical activism, but what's more important is that we are now in the first year in 1985 of Ronald Reagan's second term in office. So historically, kind of in big picture, we had this thing called the New Deal era that began with FDR and that raged all the way up through its collapse at Jimmy Carter. And then a new political era dawns with Ronald Reagan's landslide election. Actually, his landslide election was in 84. But he had a prominent election, electoral win in 1980 uh, and came into the presidency and ushered in what is often referred to as a neoconservative regime. And so he was 
just elected off of his landslide. And so in, in 1985, this is the first year of his second term. And so we're kind of at the pinnacle of the um, birth of the neoconservative regime, which arguably is dying now. And nobody quite knows what's going on politically as this particular regime dies out. It's not clear what the next one will be. Obama progressivism and whatever this woke menace is seems to be the one hand, one option. Uh, maybe what Trumpism or MAGA represents, you know, represents a second possible option. There might be different options uh, that we see coming forward. But in the 80s, what you actually had reaching back a decade earlier, uh, or a decade and a half earlier, is what was what it's often called the conservative movement with a capital C and capital M, and the neoconservative movement were working in tandem. And the neoconservative regime is basically um, the conservative aspect of the same thing as the the New Deal regime. Turns out that they're really the liberal, the progressive, and the and the the conservative ish. Uh, side of the same coin, which is all neoliberalism, which is its own thing, which is also what the woke are correctly attacking. It's what Marcuse is correctly attacking, where Marcuse is correct. And if you look at the critical theory, they're going after neoliberalism. They understand that neoliberalism is a big problem. Um, I think neoliberalism is ultimately just another huge Hegelian error. Uh, it's the ideology of the so-called deep state that arose following World War II. Um, it's this big, huge, nasty Hegelian religious project to remake the world. Sometimes it gets termed the globalist or global American empire or globalist American empire. Uh, but at the time you had these actual like weirdo globalist neocons. And then you had the conservative movement kind of as a reaction to the failures of, um, left progressive politics, a great society being kind of the most prominent going through the 70s, but that leading into stagflation and all of the other problems as the New Deal era collapsed, the progressive aspect of this neoliberal era that stretches longer. And so why do I bring all this crap up? Well, the critical Marxists were not fans of the Reagan era, and they in fact took it as emblematic of why they needed to be working underground and their radical and revolutionary politics needed to be inserted into cultural institutions quietly to establish the counter hegemony that uh, Gramsci had talked about, which had been translated in the 70s. And they realized that this is the new approach that they have to take. Um, massive, massive changes around 1970, uh, both in, in neoconservatism and in uh, kind of critical Marxism taking on Gramsci. And so what they, they understood that, that you know, education was their best bid for for generational Marxist warfare. They realized that leftism was massively under attack. The New Deal had collapsed. It was falling backwards. They were, if you look at the birth of critical race theory, you're looking from 1970 when Derek Bell published Race, Racism, and American Law going forward through 1989, even 2001, when you're seeing the major works of critical race theory being released and published, the conference being in 1989, Critical Race Theory and Introduction by Delgado and Stefanczyk in 2001. And what they're all chronicling is that all this progressive stuff had been happening coming, say, out of the civil rights era, and then it all started to get walked back. The Great Society came out and it started to get walked back. Affirmative Action came out and it started to get walked back. And so they're seeing this as a huge reactionary movement. This is where, where Marcus is in 72 writing already counter-revolution and revolt. Uh, he's identifying the counter-revolution to their revolution, and he's pissed about it. Um, by the time Reagan gets elected, they're like, oh no, we're losing. We're losing the culture. We're losing everything. The Basically, the conservative, depending on who you're looking at, either the conservatives or the neoliberals, who turned out to be largely the same people in many regards, uh, are taking over. And this was a complete disaster on all fronts for the critical Marxists. And so Reagan's presidency becomes as hugely, you have to understand how huge and symbolic the Reagan revolution was for the, for the radicals, the radical leftists at the time. And what they had decided in, in the seventies, but then were utterly convinced of by the Reagan era was that by only by infiltrating in a generational warfare sin, sense, like into the schools, could they possibly bring leftist politics back to the degree that they needed to be brought back? And that's where the Gramscian strategy really starts to take, um, you know, prominence in, in leftist Marxist thought. And so 
there's a lot going on there that's very complicated. I don't think there's been a great analysis of historically speaking. And I think I just laid out a bunch of stuff that a lot of people don't talk about. But uh, nonetheless, for our purposes, Reagan's election and then re-election become, you know, this huge blazing neon signpost to the critical Marxist that they need to install themselves deep, deep, deep into education and to begin general warfare in earnest. And because their belief that they, they, they believe that they had lost all possible hope on the so-called popular front. And we'll, we'll actually see this as we turn to this 1985 book and 1985 book review that Gottsman brings us to immediately. So the first paragraph of Gottsman's Revolutionary Movements chapter, which is again in the Critical Turn in Education book from 2016, which I strongly encourage people to read if they want to understand what's happened to our schools. The first paragraph says, in the winter 1985 issue of Harvard Educational Review, her, Martha Montero Seaberth, then an assistant professor in the Harvard Graduate School of Education, published a review of Paulo Freire's new book, The Politics of Education. Quote, Paulo Freire is known primarily for his contributions to the education of illiterate adults in the third world, noted her opening sentence. Quote, in his most recent book, The Politics of Education, Culture, Power, and Liberation, however, his pedagogical philosophy, experiences, and methodology extend far beyond geographic boundaries. They encompass the political realities of the oppressed everywhere. End quote. Now, there's a I was able to hunt down this part of the paper, and so trimmed off here is the next sentence. His message is clear. Education is inherently a political process and as such is universally political in nature. So education is a political act or teaching as a political act is going to be this key idea that you have to pay attention to when we talk about Freirean critical pedagogy or Freirean theory. It's absolutely critical that you understand that his legacy is teaching is a political act, which you will hear everywhere if you listen to education, so-called reformers or activists, all throughout the woke land uh, landscape or throughout the teachers' unions or whatever else. Back to uh, this quote from Gottsman, though. Six pages in length, the review is a broad discussion of Freire's life and ideas and a forceful call for scholars in the field to engage his approach to education. Quote, Freire's politics put history back into our hands, she concluded. Now let's pause before we go further with what she says. History is kind of, you know, the the manifestation of the deity in the Marxian theology. You have to understand that, that, you know, standing in place of God is history. And of course, man makes history through his activities. And that's going to be key to the Marxian theology. Well, if we had like three or four pillars of it, that's one of them. And so, Freire's politics put history back into our hands means that what she's recognizing is that by diving into the way that Freire sees the world, and in particular politics and education and the politics of education, they regain the handle on the reins of the course of history, which to all Marxists is a long bending arc toward what they would refer to as liberation, which is a repackaging of the communist utopia. So Freire, she tells us, Freire's politics put history back into our hands. Beyond the power of the alphabet is the power of knowledge and social action. This book enlarges our vision with each reading until the meanings become our own. And so beyond the power of the alphabet, remember his project was supposed to be literacy. But what she's saying is, when you actually understand what Freire was about, is he wasn't about literacy at all. He wasn't just about teaching the alphabet and phonics and reading to the peasants. He was about teaching the power of knowledge and social action. He was about teaching Marxian revolutionary theory through what he pretended were literacy programs for the peasants. And you can actually see that when you read Freire, say, in The Pedagogy of the Oppressed, that he talks about the whole point of trying to teach them to read is to teach them that they are dependent and to teach them that the answer to dependence is not independence uh, and personal responsibility, but rather collective action to overthrow the state of existing society. In other words, Marxian revolution which he refers to as a form of consciousness, uh, conscientis or something like this in Portuguese. Um, so 
This book, The Politics of Education, by Paulo Freire in 1985, turns out to be where Freire's relevance really begins, and this barely cited book review in the Harvard Educational Review becomes the framing into which Freire's uh, influence in, in North American education becomes significant. And this book carries a forward by Henry Giroux, Henry A. Giroux, as it happens to be G-I-R-O-U-X. He's an American, a Canadian-American or American-Canadian. I don't know which one. I think I'm a Canadian-American because he lived in Boston for a lot of this time, um, who really imported a lot of this. He was already a radical education guy. He was already basically a Marxist education theorist. And then he is stuck and he discovers um, Freire and has what appears to be, when you read his own description of it, a religious experience, having found this. And next thing you know, he's bringing this guy into the United States. He's getting him, you know, speaking engagements. He's doing all kinds of things. Uh, and everything he writes afterwards kind of contains this huge pion to, to Freire. And so he's asked to write the foreword or the introduction to this um, book, uh, Politics of Education. And so this episode of the podcast in this episode of this incredibly long and detailed series is going to focus primarily on the first half of Giroux's introduction to the politics of education. So we made it one paragraph into Gottsman's book properly, and we have to take this sidebar into this other book. And then it's going to take me two whole episodes to get through just the introduction Giroux provides to that book without even getting into that book. Now, full disclosure, I have read the introduction and about a third of this book. I have read Pedagogy of the Oppressed twice. I have not yet read Politics of Education all the way through. I read about a third of it, but I felt like I had kind of closed the necessary pieces to, to present this podcast. So I'm just going to go ahead and get this out there. Um, so hopefully I don't miss anything by having not fully completed this book. Like I said, there are a bunch of these books and it's just too much to remember to read all of it and then try to come back and rereading this stuff like the third time is frustrating and, and de demoralizing and I don't want to do it. So I'm going to try my best. But we got to take a sidebar, it's a sidebar to a sidebar to a sidebar to a sidebar. There's so many sidebars. There's so much going on with this. So since we're going to be talking about Freire for a lot of episodes in a row now, because we're going to go through this book and then we're politics of education, and then we're going to go back to the, pe to, the to this chapter of Gottsman and summarize the pedagogy of the, of the oppressed in particular. I don't think I'm going to try to get into any more of his like umpteen million books that he wrote. But we're going to get into the pedagogy of the oppressed. And that's going to be at least four and maybe six or eight podcasts. This uh, politics of education is going to be at least a couple more, probably several more. So sooner or later, we're going to get out of Freire, who is not the guy. And we're going to get to other people who are also kind of not the guy. That'll be like Samuel Bowles and Herbert Gintis, or Harold Gintis, Herbert Gintis, something Gintis, G-I-N-T-I-S. And then... Uh, Michael Apple, probably Stanley Aronowitz. There's like a whole bunch of people. Like Ira Shore we might have to touch on. There's all these other people. And then finally, we're going to get to Henry Giroux. And Henry Giroux is the guy. There's so damn much stuff these people did through the 70s and early 80s up to this kind of point at 85 where Freire gets like picturing like the big turkey injector just jamming all the Freire juice into already Marxist education, where they've already kind of captured the schools of colleges of education by the early 80s. By 85, it's just like Freirean theology just getting jammed in. Uh, so since we're going to talk about Freire a lot for the next umpteen podcasts here that I do in this series, I think it's important for me to say this. And I've asked a few Brazilians about this. I've got mixed replies. I don't know what to do. I get the vibe. So this is my personal impression, having read some Freire and having more importantly read what people who became Freirean devotees, how they react to Freire. I don't think he was just a Marxist. In fact, I think he was a guru. And I think it's really important to understand that this Freire guy represents something really different. And that's what this podcast is really going to be about. We have to understand what this character represents to understand why they took the giant turkey baster and inject, injected so much of this obvious menace into our education system, besides the fact that they're also radicals and Marxists. So what is a guru? A guru is a kind of a fraud, right? And he moves people 
to his ideas, not because of the uh, the validity of those ideas, but because of the force of his personality. And uh, this is more important, the degree of mystification clouded around them, where you're led to believe that right answers to your questions exist, but that you can't possibly quite get at them yourself. And you know the guru has the answers, so if you just go back to the guru, the all-knowing source, he'll seem to make them clearly visible, mostly by spouting off nonsensical and self-contradictory poppycock. The best explanation, and this is a tangent or sidebar, if you have time, you should go read this. There's this paper written by a feminist named Martha Nussbaum. I think it was written in 1990 or thereabouts about Judith Butler. Now, Martha Nussbaum was no fan of Judith Butler when she wrote this paper. And maybe it was later, maybe it was around 2000. But at any rate, she calls her the professor of parody. And I think that's the title of the paper, Martha Nussbaum, the professor of parody. And she lays out that Judith Butler with her impossibly obtuse language and her complete jibber jabber that's very, it is actually discern. You can actually figure out what Judith Butler's talking about, but it takes a lot of work. She's the post-structural feminist section of, of all of this crap. But Nussbaum absolutely rips her apart for exhibiting what she refers to as, as the guru mechanism. And I get this same vibe off of Freire where Judith Butler says a bunch of stuff that doesn't seem to make any sense, and so you have to listen to her again to, for her to tell you what it supposedly means, which if she says it in sufficiently obtuse, uh, impenetrable jargon, then you never are quite sure what she means, so you always have to keep going back, going back to the source. You can get this sense of what that guru mechanism is. I don't get that from Freire. I don't find his writing difficult to read, as a matter of fact. Um, I find it to be uh, impossible to to have right. It's like he's telling you that basically whatever you do is wrong, but there is a right way. And if you whatever you're actually doing is wrong, but there's a right way. And so it's it's more that you can't ever nail down what correct is. And so what you're going to go do if he's your guru is you're going to go try to put into practice what he did and he, you're, it's not going to work and you're going to come back and he's going to say, no, here's what you did wrong because it's got to be like this. And then the thing he says is either self-contradictory or just kind of nonsense. Like, you know, teachers have to become like students and students have to become like teachers. That's a gigantic theme for him. But it's like, it's not even clear what this means. And when you go try to put it in practice, nothing works. And you come back and you say, well, he'll say, you know, something like, this is another huge Freirean theme we're going to see, is that Freire always has to be... There's no prescription that you, they say that they all say this. Giroux says it, a bunch of people say it. There's no prescription you can take from Freire because everything is only possible in its exact specific context. So the vibe as a guru that you get is that he knows how it should be done, but you're just going to do it wrong until he tells you how you did it wrong. And you're going to try again and you're going to do it wrong. And he's going to tell you how you did it wrong. And it's all because you never quite got the right the context, right? You couldn't take his teaching and, and apply it to the correct context of the world. And so that's the vi- the guru vibe I get off of him. And the, the strongest part though, isn't just reading him. I don't necessarily get that vibe too strongly, you know, five out of 10, four out of 10 reading his work. But when you read the people who took him up, Like they take him up as this life changing event and they just fawn over him. And it's really weird. So, this guru phenomenon around Freire that I think is so important to kind of keep in the back of your head when you engage with stuff about critical pedagogy is very visible in everything his followers wrote about him, not so much in just what he wrote. And, you know, like I said, it's also visible in Freire himself, who essentially frames everything that he says as being the one and only way, but only when you get it exactly right for the context, which is different in every possible context and is always shifting around and moving. And so you can't ever quite hit the target, but he knows how to hit the target, but he can't ever quite hit it. And it was your fault, not his, because he's got the the correct idea. And then with the force of his char- charisma and his person and his when you read these experiences people had with them, the weirdness that it causes them to shift into, um, you, you just get this feeling that he's this guru figure for them. Um, but even Henry Giroux just fawns over this guy. Uh, he's He's got a book called On Critical Pedagogy that's like 2011 or something. And he has this, these really weird chapters about what it's like to be in his presence and drinking wine and all of these just almost like 
semi-mystical experience he's having just being in the presence of the guy. It's really weird. It's really, really weird. Um, the impression you get is that Freire's devoted followers are constantly trying to live up to some kind of a standard that is probably deliberately impossible. And the standard is located, therefore, in the weirdly incredible personality of their guru in the person of Paulo Freire. And so just to get a taste, though, let me I mean, I've just rambled about it, but let me give you a taste of this um, weird fawning thing, which it's like I said, it's it's virtually ubiquitous. So a lot of Freire's books were translated by a guy named Donato Macedo. Um, and he translated my the copy of uh, Pedagogy of the Oppressed that I have, as well as the copy of the Politics of Education that I have. And his translator's note contains this weird fawning paragraph where he's trying to say how hard it is to translate Paulo's writing, Freire's writing. But you see this weird guru fawning thing. So he says, a central theme in Paulo Freire's work is his insistence on the need for readers to adopt a critical attitude when reading a text. That is, readers should critically evaluate the text and not passively accept what is said just because the author said it. Which, if you look at that from an iron law of woke projection, by the way, is exactly what Freire wants people to do, is to take him as a guru authority. But readers should critically evaluate the text and do not passively accept what is said just because the author said it. Readers must always be prepared to question and to doubt what they have read. Though I have long been inspired, here we get to the fawning, though I have long been inspired by Freire's challenge, I must admit that I did not so profoundly understand the significance of his insistence that readers be critical and predisposed to question and doubt until I confronted the many dimensions of Freire's thought while translating the contents of this book to avoid committing serious and unforgivable translation errors and distorting his brilliant and forceful ideas. I was forced to meticulously read and reread each word, each sentence, and each paragraph in order to engage in a deeper dialogue with the author through his book. I had to understand deeply and experience his concepts in order to render them into English, preserving the same force without sacrificing the music and the poetry of his eloquent prose. It's always like this when you read people who got into Freire. I mean, I read the Pedagogy of the Press, and I read literally Macedo's translation of it, and I guess it's supposed to convey this poetry and music or whatever of his eloquent prose, and it's like, it's readable. But this is like a this is like cult devotion, and you find it everywhere with the people who took him up. Um, this weird fawning writing about Freire, and it's even worse when they talk about spending time with him. It just gets totally nuts about being in his presence and what it's like and how overwhelmed they were in these ways. It's really weird, and all the emphasis goes on the weird. Um, so why? And that's what we really want to hit on in this episode is why, uh, aside from any characteristics of Freire's person or psychology that maybe predisposed him to being kind of a cult leader. Um, and, and if we if we back away from blaming the person of Freire, it's what he offered more than anything is faith and hope. And that's huge. And those are all to be rooted in some, quote, new dimension. That's how uh, Henry Drew describes it. New dimension of Marxist analysis that that Freire opens the door to, and then as if Gottsman has it right, that, that Giroux then channels into our education system. So as Giroux puts it in his introduction to the politics of education here, he says, equally important is the insight that domination is more than the simple imposition of arbitrary power by one group over another. Instead, for Freire, the logic of domination represents a combination of historical and contemporary ideological and material practices that are never completely successful, always embody contradictions, and are constantly being fought over within asymmetrical relations of power. Underlying Freire's language of critique in this case is the insight that history is never foreclosed. So this is where hope is going to come in. Is the insight that history is never foreclosed. Remember, Marx had this really strict historicism, and then the critical Marxists, the neo-Marxists, started to get very skeptical of that, and they started to see two possible ends. Capitalism will collapse, but we might fall into fascism unless we save ourselves by going into liberated socialism. So Marx saw that capitalism is going to eventually spawn the revolution, socialism's an inevitability, 
the critical Marxists said that's not the, the case. We might end up in fascism instead. So it's up to socialists to save the world. But it has to be liberated socialism, not the thing that happened in the Russian Revolution, which spawned Lenin and then Stalin, which wasn't so good. And then all of this is not working out. And so it's not looking good. And there's this whole negative despair thing. We'll talk about that more in a minute. But what we see here is Freire's offering hope, the insight, as Giroux puts it, that history is never foreclosed. And that just as the actions of men and women are limited by the specific constraints in which they find themselves, they also make those constraints and the possibilities that may follow from challenging them. So we get to write our own history going forward, again, following Freire. So this is hope, and it, it, it gives the, the possibility of, of faith that's not just blind faith like Marcusa is talking about that, you know, we've forgotten certain uh, historical possibilities that have come to be regarded as utopian possibilities. I think that was how he phrased it in um, repressive tolerance, but it might be an essay on liberation. I'm pretty sure it's repressive tolerance. So Drew going on about Freire again says, it is within this theoretical juncture that Freire introduces a new dimension to radical educational theory and practice. I say it is new because he links the process of struggle to the particularities of people's lives while simultaneously arguing for a faith in the power of the oppressed to struggle in the interests of their own liberation. So this is why he's a guru. This is what he's offering. He is a spiritual leader. He is a weird spiritualist. And there's even all this stuff about liberation theology that's probably the subject of the next episode we're going to have to get to to connect to this. So Jeru says, this is a notion of education fashioned in a more than critique and uh, in more than critique and Orwellian pessimism. It is a discourse that creates a new starting point by trying to make hope realizable and despair unconvincing. And where is that hope and that faith located? In the power of the oppressed to struggle in the interests of their own liberation. How? By making the personal political, which is going to fuse that feminist thing in the U.S. Uh, eventually when it gets here. The struggle of the particularities of people's lives. Not just pessimistic Orwellian <laughs> Marcusean stuff, not just critique, but no, we're going to get into the nitty gritties of people's lives. That's going to be the center of politics. The personal is going to become political. And we're going to have faith that the political, that the personal as political is going to be able to reveal to people the true nature of oppression so that when they realize I am oppressed, therefore I am, they can then struggle in solidarity to uh, achieve their own liberation. So you can see this fusion into all of these ideas that Marcusa had, but he didn't have an actionable plan. And so what you have is all these Marcusian theorists coming through the 60s, 70s, and now into the 80s, who know that Marcusa is onto something, but they have no idea how to actualize it. And Giroux, who is big into Marcusa, big into Gramsci, big into Derrida, big into Horkheimer, big into all of these critical Marxist and postmodernist things, what you have in, Freire, in Giroux is finding Freire and seeing hope. And he has a religious conversion to this Freirean personal is political kind of view. And that's going to be really important to understand. So the element of faith that he has is rooted in solidarity. And that's the key component. Remember, that's the fourth section of Marcuse's essay on liberation. To, to achieve liberation, we actually have to have solidarity. When we read the beginning of Kimberly Crenshaw's Mapping the Margins from 1991, what does she say? That the, the disparate voices of a few can't affect change, but the voices of millions united in solidarity to end their oppression, can do so. And that's what she calls a meaningful politics of identity. So you can see how these pieces come together to form identity Marxism. And where is this happening? What's the crucible? It turns out the crucible was our education system. Uh, critical Marxism was missing the hope and faith aspect that would create the solidarity around the idea that all oppression, even though they compete with one another in the so-called oppression Olympics, which technically is known as competitive victimhood, which if you have read uh, 
the the what is it called the rise of victimhood culture by manning and campbell or campbell and manning both of whom don't like me now by the way they think i've gone crazy uh you can read a lot about that i recommend the book even though they hate me uh you can also look back at my episode when i went on joe rogan last summer and uh, rogan like i told it said competitive victimhood and he just started cracking up like he thought i made it up but it's really funny but that's really the term in in sociology is competitive victimhood even though they have that whole competitive victimhood thing the the basis for solidarity isn't there. Uh, they have to have something that confers faith and hope that solidarity will achieve something. And that's what Freire is offering. And his own status as kind of a cult, culty guru kind of character, I think, is what cements it. But his writing itself, this idea that by getting into the nitty gritties of the personal being the political and then that everybody needs to understand that oppression is oppression is oppression in whatever ugly form it takes and that they have solidarity in that and that's the whole system with its many various facets of oppression operating together in this matrix of domination that was later named by Patricia Hill Collins. That is the thing that there's now hope to be in solidarity against. And so um, what we have then, kind of backing up a little bit, is... Uh, you know, this weird Marcusean theology, which I haven't outlined after that podcast at some point, and critical Marxism is sort of based on this coming out of the 1960s, uh, is a very antinomian theology. Uh, you know, it's based off of the great refusal for fuck's sake. And so by the 1970s, you know, what you have is a, this is a very despairing kind of movement. You have postmodernism rising up as post-Marxists. They're very despairing. You have this all, uh, you know, hitting this kind of pinnacle of negative thinking. Uh, everything seems lost. Counter-revolution and revolt. You can see that Marcuse is very direct in how he's talking about how they need to reclaim uh, the mantle of what, what they're trying to achieve, but that you can have this, you know, whoa, all is lost. Everything's despair kind of vibe there. And so you, you can see it though, just in the theory preceding that critical theory or critical Marxism and Marcuse's emphasis is all on negative thinking. Theodore Adorno says you can't cast a positive image of the utopia. He writes this book called Negative Dialectics, where you give up on the idea of synthesis entirely, and you're just going to take apart, you're going to take your thesis and you're going to hit it with the ant antithesis, specifically just to get down to particulars. You have all this kind of mixing off of the back of existentialism, which is just wholly nihilistic and despairing, and this is all kind of being reflected back and forth with the rise of postmodernism, which is not, of course, critical Marxism. It is, in fact, post-Marxism but it's still anti-capitalist and anti-neoliberal. And so you have this huge kind of morass of very despair-ridden leftism, whether that's existentialist, postmodernist, which is tied up in existentialism, whether it's uh, you see it at the through the 60s. You see it through the 60s in the critical Marxists, uh, critical theorists. The element of hope and faith, and the faith is what undergirds the hope, just isn't there. It's just all turned to despair, and that becomes what's key for Freire, because until this hope and faith dawns upon, you know, later stage critical Marxists who become woke, they they were running thin on hope. They were running out of hope. I mean, look at what was going on in the world. The Soviet Union had ground down to a broken state. Uh, Stalin's crimes had been confessed. Nothing good is is happening off of leftism. Leftism is in dire straits. Even the kind of progressivism of the U.S. is being beat back by the extraordinarily neoliberal, uh, neoconservative movement, uh, and it's kind of in tandem a real conservative movement uh, that was running along with it. So Freirean theory steps in and 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 gives something that was missing, faith and hope. And in so doing, ironically, just to take a further aside, I know we're getting way off track, um, it did something another very infamous character in history did and understood, but not, not the same. It's not the same. I don't want to give that. But what the, another very infamous character who was dealing with the failures of Marxism understood that you have to give people a framework for faith and hope. So I'm not trying to equate these two, don't get me wrong, but you have to understand so as a society inside of an aside, this is exactly what Adolf Hitler recommended as counter-Marxism. This is key counter-Marxist observation. I, for better or for worse, uh, when I flew out to Phoenix recently, I read the first volume of Mein Kampf again. 
Uh, I don't know that I properly understood it the first time, and I got a lot more out of it this time. Um, and Hitler argues in Mein Kampf that the Marxists, um, when you understand them on their own terms, believed that they were not offering an ideology at all. They were offering the answer to ideology, or as uh, Hitler phrases it, that they they were unable to realize that they have their own, what the, what we would translate from the German as outlook upon the world, and Weltanschauung. Uh, and so what he said is, what Hitler says is that the Marxists are unaware that they have their own Weltanschauung. And it's a lie they tell themselves that they don't have their own Weltanschauung, that they're the liberation from a Weltanschauung, and that this poisons people and it makes them miserable. Um, and so he says part of the remedy is, in fact, that you have to offer people a clear outlook upon the world, a Weltanschauung, which is roughly a religion. And he offered it, of course, in the form of National Socialism, which was based in all kinds of crackpot shit that was no good, like Aryan mysticism, eugenics, a kind of hyperactive folkish nationalism, German folk being the relevant folk, with Aryanism being kind of this weird mystical Aryanism being the justification for all of his race crap, and eugenics being the program. Like, he had this really bad set of ideas. Um that was rooted in being, if you read through Mein Kampf, he's pissed off about the state of German politics. He's pissed off at Germany's state in the world. This is all obvious. But he's also really pissed off at the Marxists, like really pissed off at the Marxists. In fact, he really hates the Marxist, which turned out to lead him down a really bad road, which was anti-Semitism. Uh, you can actually see and it's in the second chapter of, of Mein Kampf where Hitler starts basically saying, you know, blah, 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 the Marxists. And then he says, which is to say the Jew. And you can see where he just equates Jews and Marxists, which, by the way, if we look at our <clears throat> our friends in the broadly neo-reactionary movement or with certain wings of the neo-reactionary movement happening today, they also make this same error. They see as Hitler did, that lots of people who are Marxist were Jewish, and he says that it is basically the full expression of true Jewishness. Now, there's all kinds of, we're not going to get into all of this mess. Um, there's all kinds of complicated stuff going on around that, but it turned Hitler to vigorous anti-Semitism, which was already, of course, a thing within circles of German nationalism, which he was very attracted to. And then when he pile onto that eugenics and Aryan race mysticism, you've just got a, a terrible recipe. So I'm not saying that Freire and Hitler are the same, but what they both accomplished was giving people a sense of hope and faith in something. And they understood that that's the missing ingredient and Marxism doesn't have. In fact, incidentally, Hitler was perfectly clear, ardently clear. He says very clearly that he completely recognizes and understands the Marxist tactics very, very well. And in fact, he found them so powerful that he incorporated them and used them in his own for his own purposes. In fact, a lot of his propaganda is modeled after how the Marxists pissed him off. And I really do mean pissed him off. He also talks about, <laughs> in fact, he has this kind of hilarious paragraph or set of paragraphs in there where he's talking about where he would argue with Marxists until his voice went hoarse. And how they will just, I think he actually may, identify, I don't know if he identifies them as Marxists or Jews at that point, but he means the same thing. And he would say that he would argue with them and he would, till his voice would go hoarse and they would just pretend that he wasn't right when he was obviously right and they were obviously contradictory. And even when they were shown to be wrong the next day, they would just pretend that they won the argument and it just literally drove him bonkers. And it's like, that is like arguing with the woke. Like, and it, like Hitler's like, I got so pissed off, you know, and it's like, yep. Um, so that's bad. Uh, but yeah, so that's a tangent upon a tangent upon a tangent. The point that I really wanted to raise by bringing up Hitler at all, I mean, just read Mein Kampf, is that, in fact, what Hitler recognized is that if you want to move people to accomplish something, you have to give them a kind of positive religious structure, an outlook on the world, a Weltanschauung. And what Freire is offering in his faith and hope through solidarity, which Marcuse talked about but didn't actualize, is that. And that's why Freire becomes this huge influential figure, not equating him to Hitler. I'm saying that he was, because he's not actually, he's in fact not at all. What I'm saying is that what Freire offered critical Marxism is that ingredient of faith and hope instead of just relentless despair, negative thinking, blah, blah, blah. 
like, you know, where Marcuse says, oh, the negative thinking will become positive and that the, the utopian society is contained within the existing society if we can just strip off all of the, all of the oppression and domination. Um, so, so what Freire is offering is, is hope and faith based in that hope, kind of in a very Hebrews 11 kind of way, maybe. Uh, but you also have to understand that Freire, hope isn't hope. Hope is critical hope. Critical theory has a perverted version of freaking everything. They have critical love too, which is to basically psychologically abuse people through critical theory because you love them and want them not to feel privileged or be trapped by systems of domination anymore. Uh, but they have critical hope. And we'll probably have to do an entire episode somewhere in this critical pedagogy series on critical hope because it's a really key idea. But I'll kind of summarize briefly. It's one of these things you're, you're about to hear how freaking hard it is to understand what these ideas are. But what it boils down to, what critical hope boils down to, is the hope that critical Marxism will work this time. And we're going to get the utopia. We're going to get the liberation through solidarity. And so in the words of a of another commonly cited education theorist in, in the kind of the critical tradition, uh, Michelinos Zambilas, uh, quote, to say that someone is critically hopeful means that the person is involved in a critical analysis of power relations and how they constitute one's emotional ways of being in the world while attempting to construct imaginatively and materially a different life world. So it's basically this Marcusean belief that there is a utopia contained within the world. And if we can just criticize the bad stuff away, we can reimagine the world in a new way, imaginatively and materially, and achieve a different life world. You'll notice that these are kind of very religious ways to phrase things. So I don't know if that actually clarifies for you what critical hope is. If you hadn't heard my explanation that it means hope that critical theory is going to work this time. Um, but let me give you another description from the same paper that I got that quote from, which is The Social Justice Turn, Cultivating Critical Hope in an Age of Despair by Carrie Grain and Darren Lund, which was published in 2016 in the Michigan Journal of Community Service Learning. They describe critical hope this way. Critical hope is, on the one hand, a conceptual and theoretical direction, and on the other, an action-oriented response to contemporary despair. As an idea, it is inspired by the praxis and frameworks of critical theory, particularly those emerging from the Frankfurt School, neo-Marxist critiques, and the work of Freire. It can be summarized as, quote, an act of ethical and political responsibility that has the potential to recover a lost sense of connectedness, relationality, and solidarity with others. That cites the same Zambilas that I just quoted a moment ago. We propose that the social justice turn in service learning is premised on and can be aided by the necessary tension between criticality of privilege, charity, hegemony, representation, history, and inequality, along with a hope that is neither naive nor idealistic, but that remains committed to ideals of justice, reflexivity, and solidarity, which is a whole lot of words that don't really mean anything, except what it really means is we believe that if we can find solidarity against all forms of oppression through critical Marxist theory, then we can achieve liberation. So critical hope means we're going to be critical theorists because it's going to work this time. That's what critical hope means. So when we say that what Freire offered people was hope, that's the hope. And the faith that he was able to restore is that the utopia is possible if we all become sufficiently critical in the right way that his weird guru stature uh, tries to promote, which has to be perfectly, constantly contextual. And we're going to see there's another ingredient, which is that it has to apply to everything. So anyway, like most critical theory concepts, this isn't exactly clear. Critical hope, they don't describe things in clear terms, but it boils down to uh, something very obvious. If you believe in critical theory hard enough, then we can have the utopia. It's also really clear where it comes from. They told you. It comes from critical Marxism. It comes from the Frankfurt School. It comes from critical theory. It comes from Freire himself with his uh, view of critical education. So the simplest summary is that critical hope means hope that by, quote, doing the work, liberation can be achieved. Of course, not to draw ominous parallels again, but this represents a return, in fact, to one of the core pillars of Marxian theology, which I still need to outline Marxian theology for you. So I've already kind of hinted at one of the pillars of Marxian theology. Now we're going to hit another P 
pillar of Marxian theology, uh, which is probably most clearly recognizable in its original German, which is a famous phrase in German, Arbeit macht frei. Work makes you free. And so I'm not going to go into the whole Marxist theology thing right now, but the idea is that by doing the work and having solidarity in the work, critical praxis becomes a location of hope, which becomes a key element of woke faith. And this cements its greatest theologian, Paulo Freire, as a kind of critical education prophet who gets treated as a guru by everybody who becomes devoted to him. And that's how he ends up taking over all of education. It's very important, I think, to understand how deeply religious this all is. All of the doing the work, everything we're going to talk about with regard to critical pedagogy, with regard to Freire, etc., all comes back to this belief that the work sets you free. That, and we'll even see when in the next episode is probably where I'm going to turn to this liber- liberation theology influence as Giroux and Freire talk about it in the politics of education. And what's very obvious there is that they're attempting to build, as Marx intended, the garden. The garden out of the jungle, as Marx would have had it or the Garden of Eden being remade. Uh, I believe Marcuse at one point in one of his works says, uh, maybe it's in One Dimensional Man, it is, where he says that the way to get back into the garden is to take a second bite of the fruit of the tree of knowledge. Because it's Gnostic. So this is all a Gnostic religion, like I've been trying to tell people again and again. And if you don't understand that this is a Gnostic religion, you're not going to understand anything that's going on. So if you don't understand that when this is in public schools, that this is a state religion, that the state is pretending isn't a religion, then you don't know what's going on, nor do you know how to stop it. Because the way this has to be stopped ultimately is by getting this declared at the level of Supreme Court jurisprudence to be religious and therefore not endorsable by the state and not appropriate in any state outlet, including our public schools and including our military and every other thing that it's worked into, all of our public services. You can see this vibe, though, pretty clearly further down in Drew's introduction to the politics of education. He explains there the nature of how Freyarian theory should be engaged. This is that guru thing again. In order to be true to the spirit of Freire's most profound pedagogical beliefs, he says, it must be stated that he would never argue that his work is meant to be adapted in grid-like fashion to any site or pedagogical context. What Freire does is provide, sorry, what Freire does, what, sorry, I did it wrong again. What Freire does provide is a meta-language that generates a set of categories and social practices that have to be critically mediated by those who would use them for the insights they might provide in different historical settings and contexts. Freire's work is not meant to offer radical recipes for instant forms of critical pedagogy. Rather, it is a series of theoretical signposts that need to be decoded and critically appropriated within the specific context in which they might be useful. So this is, of course, what I was saying a little bit ago about the guru thing. This is also um, where, you know, you really need to understand this more as like a, you know, well, if you have a personal relationship with God, then you can walk with God and you don't really need to follow the doctrine or whatever kind of religious view. Um, If you have a personal relationship with the theory, if you understand the theory the way the prophet has put out the theory, Freire being the prophet, then what you understand is that in every single context, you are going to have to do, you're going to have to, to make it critical in the way that fits that context. And so, this is uh, this is where that a guru mechanism becomes very powerful, but also where you you start to understand this as being not something that is exactly based on doctrine, and therefore is not something that you would indoctrinate students or teachers into. In fact, this is a explicit uh, refusal of doctrine. Right, his work. Uh, that he would never argue that his work is meant to be adapted in a grid-like fashion to any site or pedagogical context. Instead, it's a meta-language. He gives you a meta-language that generates a set of categories and social practices, he says. And those are going to be critically mediated by people who truly understand him, by the anointed. So that's what's going on. And what is it supposed to achieve? Well, Giroux tells us, education, in Freire's view, becomes both an ideal and a referent for change in the service of a new kind of society. 
as an ideal. Education speaks to a form of cultural politics that transcends the theoretical boundaries of any one specific political doctrine, while also linking social theory and practice to the deepest aspects of emancipation. So guys, this is Marxian theology through and through. One specific political doctrine is what Marx would interpret as an ideology, and the point of Marxism is supposed to be the end of ideology. So we're going to transcend the boundaries of any one specific political doctrine. So we're going to end ideology and education while also linking social theory and practice to the deepest aspects of emancipation. So now what you have is this social theory and practice being the doing the work thing where the work is informed by the theory, and the theory creates a result, and that informs the theory, and then you have action, and then you have reflection, and then you have this, so this whole praxis wheel where there's theory, uh, sorry, there's theory, action, reflection, theory, action, reflection, theory, action, reflection, and a dialectical relationship, and the theory and practice are to be wedded. Remember, that's we talked about that in a different one of the other episodes where we talked about the way that Marx, Marxists see practice and theory as being separated by specifically the uh, division of labor, and that by doing, by ending ideology and focusing on genuine work, the uh, Arbeit macht frei. The work will make you free. And that's where the deepest aspect of emancipation exists. And so that's what this is supposed to do. So you're supposed to turn your schools into a seminary for this Marxian theology that's hidden in other language. Um, so for what it's worth, by the way, with this critical hope stuff, Freire, which is what all this is based on, this is the thing that that Freire brings to the table is critical hope that becomes the basis for a faith like you see in Hebrews 11, where, you know, it is the faith is the hope. How does it go? Faith is the hope for, for that. I don't remember how to say it. I have to look it up. Um, you guys know Hebrews 11 better than I do. I'm not a Bible scholar. Let's see what it says. Um, I, I used to have this memorized. Uh, Faith in action. Faith is a confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. So it's Hebrews 11, 1. So that's where you see this connection, right? That's what Freire is bringing. And he has this whole book about critical hope. And this concept, which we'll have to come back to, is the is central to another critical education theorist named Megan Buller. So if what I'm bringing this up for right now is if you are interested in figuring out what's going on in schools and how freaking horrible it is, and you have the time on your hands before I can get to Megan Buller, B-O-L-E-R, uh, you really need to go look into her stuff about critical hope as praxis. And in fact, what you really need to look into is her so-called pedagogy of discomfort. And the so-called pedagogy of discomfort, this this is the thing, the idea where when we were doing the grievance studies affair that I ended up on the phone with Mike Nano one night talking to him to Australia, talking to him. So it's probably morning for him. Uh, I remember and I said, you know, this pedagogy, what, what had happened was we wrote the, per, the, the pro progressive stack fake paper where we argued that we should basically abuse kids um, as an educational experience, experiential reparations, we call it, to overcome privilege. So they shouldn't be allowed to speak in class. They should listen and learn in silence. They shouldn't have their emails answered. They should be interrupted and talked over. If they're male, if they're white, they should be invited to sit in the floor and wear chains to experience reparations and be humiliated. And then we said this should all be approached through compassion. We should do it compassionately, which we thought was hilarious through a, we, a thing termed critically compassionate intellectualism. And then the peer reviewers loved this whole idea of the educational program, but they said, no, you need to engage the pedagogy of discomfort and pointed us to Megan Bowler, who we, we had not heard of at that point. And this pedagogy of discomfort was the thing where I'm talking to my Nana on the phone and I'm like, dude, like people have heard me tell the story before. Where I just realized like, this is like, bad, bad, bad stuff. Like this is the makings of a genocide. And it is the fact of the pedagogy of discomfort, which deserves like its whole episode, its own whole episode, is this idea that making privileged kids uncomfortable and making them sit in discomfort is the only way to overcome their privilege. And so that's the key objective of a critical education is to make privileged kids uncomfortable. In other words, to in in cult language, induce vulnerability and give them a pathway out of that vulnerability through cult doctrine and to slowly separate themselves from other people who are like that or like who they used to be, the other privileged people. This is straight up 
child abuse for the point of cult indoctrination. And the point, if we put it in German, would be Alf Havender privilege. The goal is a strategic application of child abuse to achieve Marxist ends. That's critical hope. That's where critical hope lives, is in the pedagogy of discomfort, the the educational theory of making people uncomfortable. And just remember, this isn't some fringe, stupid idea in education. When Black Lives Matter was burning down cities in summer of 2020 after St. Floyd died, we had people like uh, the Democratic Congresswoman, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, come out on TV and say that change is supposed to be uncomfortable. Learning about white privilege is supposed to be uncomfortable. She was invoking the pedagogy of discomfort. And so this is a very mainstream idea that's had very practical applications, unfortunately, in our world. And so this is actually really important. So if you have the time, if you want to beat me to it, please do. Go look into Megan Buller, look into Critical Hope, and look into uh, the pedagogy of discomfort. It's super important. I'm not doing that here, though. I just wanted to point out that hope and the faith predicated upon that hope is what Freire brings to the table uh, that makes him this kind of guru figure. So now we can set all that aside. We now have this context. We now understand a lot more of what's going on with this guy. We can go back to Giroux's introduction to the politics of education to understand even more of what critical pedagogy is really about and how it becomes where woke really comes from. Because what we see is this shift out of critical Marxism or even academic leftism into identity Marxism. We see the shift away from economic Marxism, classical Marxism, into identity Marxism. Uh, and, and, and we see that in Freire, and we see Drew echoing it as one of the chief contributions that Freire brings. But you also have to remember that Drew was significant in blending in Marcuse, who had already called for the shift in the 60s and 70s. In One Dimensional Man, he mentions it in Repressive Tolerance. It's basically the key thesis of Essay on Liberation. So Giroux would have understood the shift to identity politics thing, and he sees this idea in Freire that all oppression is intrinsically linked, right? And so he's going to actualize this. Uh, so a generation of Marcusian academic left activists in education were actually primed, Giroux kind of being a chief figurehead, to take up the Freirean concepts and to make the way for the woke identity Marxism of today. And again, the crucible in which this was occurring was education, which means that the reagents inside the crucible that are getting burned to a crisp are your children. And the purpose is to create a revolution in society, to make gold out of lead, as they would see it. Uh, your children are the target of this uh, process. And so what, is, what does Giroux say here with regard to this? He says, Freire has rightly argued that domination cannot be reduced exclusively to a form of class domination. With the notion of difference as a guiding theoretical thread, Freire rejects the idea that there's a universalized form of oppression. Instead, he acknowledges and locates within different social fields forms of suffering that speak to particular modes of domination and, consequently, diverse forms of collective struggle and resistance. By recognizing that certain forms of oppression are not reducible to class oppression, Freire steps outside standard Marxist analyses by arguing that society contains a multiplicity of social relations which contain contradictions and can serve as a basis for which social groups can struggle and organize themselves. This becomes clear in those social relations in which the ideological and material conditions of gender, racial, and age discrimination are at work. So you see here the priming of the intersectional pump. So previous episode of the podcast, we're talking about the birthplace of, interse of intersectionality being in the Combahee River Collective and the Black Feminists, and what the Black Feminists took by combining Black liberationism, Marxist feminism, and Marcusian New Left academic leftism and turning it into kind of one melting pot of all oppression is linked. And then you have this education theorist totally removed from that half a decade earlier saying kind of the same thing. And what you have is all these people kind of thinking the same along the same axes of how do we revitalize critical Marxism after neo-Marxism or critical theory is dying out? How do we revitalize it? And this shift into identity politics and the personal being political is going to be the key. And with Freire getting picked up by Giroux, this is going to get mainlined, like I said, into education. It's not going to stay up in the ether. It's not going to be confined to law like we saw Crenshaw arguing or they 
pretend critical race theory is only about law. We see this here with Drew talking about a book in 1985 saying that this is the mentality that needs to enter into education. This is the mentality. And this is, this is Freire's breakout moment in the United States was this is it. This is the thing. All the forms of oppression are linked together. You can't understand them under any overarching umbrella, but you have to understand them in terms of personal being political. And when you do that, when you get to that granular level, you can create solidarity upon everybody believing the same thing, that the personal is the political is the side of, uh, of politics. And so you see, again, the shift to identity Marxism is very clearly happening through these lines of theorists. And Again, this is to be mainlined into the school so that your kids will grow up thinking along identity Marxist lines, thinking in terms of identity constantly, thinking in terms of identity oppression constantly. And in the context of, you remember with the Ronald Reagan stuff, that this is a generational war to shift America out of conservatism and into radicalism. Uh, so what problem is identity Marxism supposed to solve? Well, according to Drew, it's the contrasting false choice that was outlined by Marcuse when he analyzed the state of mid-20th century uh, politics as an apparent commitment to either the domination of capitalism in the West or to the despair of Soviet-style socialism in the USSR, which, if it could just get its act together, already has the right formula but isn't doing it right. Um which of course was in its final years in 1985. So what you have is this contrasting false choice between um, domination and despair. And the way he puts it is Paulo Freire's newest book, which is this one, Politics and Education. Um, Paulo Freire's newest book appears at an important time for education. In fact, this is referring to the Reagan problem. In the United States, schools have become the subject of an intense national debate forged in a discourse that joins conservatives and radicals alike in their denunciation of public schools and American education. While specific criticisms differ among the diverse ideological positions, the critics share a discourse steeped in the language of crisis and critique. For conservatives, the language of crisis and critique becomes clear in their assertion that schools have failed to take seriously their alleged commitment to, demand, to the demands of capitalist rationality and the imperatives of a market economy. In other words, the conservatives are complaining that the schools, this is 1985, are already turning into radical kind of indoctrination programming mills and that they're not preparing kids to take part in the economy which, of course, progressives think is exactly wrong. They're trying to reproduce capitalism, so the stupid Marxists are pissed about that. But that's the conservatives are saying, no, you're already Marxist, you're already turning our schools Marxist, and you're not preparing our kids for the market economy, which this is alleged commitment to the demands of capitalist rationality and the imperatives of the market economy. Uh, the crisis pointed to, he says, in this case, resides in the lagging state of the American economy and stagflation of the 70s and the or the, I lost my place uh, and the diminishing role of the United States in shaping world affairs many on the radical left by contrast write off schools as simply a reflex of the labor market as reproductive sites that smoothly provide the knowledge skills and social relations necessary for the functioning of the capitalist economy and dominant society public education no longer provides the tools for critical thinking and transformative action. In other words, it's not Marxist. Like the workplace and the realm of mass culture, schools have become a device for economic and cultural reproduction. Within these contrasting positions, the language of crisis and critique has collapsed into either the discourse of domination or the discourse of despair. So I include this little historical piece. This is, in fact, the first thing that Giroux really says um, in his introduction, because it's a key piece for understanding what the critical Marxists thought they were achieving by infiltrating education. They framed out the whole world as a key generational batter, battleground between the discourse of domination and the discourse of despair. And what Freire and critical pedagogy are offering in this book in particular, but then also in Pedagogy of the Oppressed, as Giroux is bringing this into the North American market, isn't just a third alternative. It's not just a way out, is it? but also that hope and that faith and a, and a new opportunity and also a language or a meta language, as he said, based in a theoretical construct for understanding schools themselves as part of the culture industry that was decried by the neo-Marxists. So that's where, that's where, they, where, where, where Giroux says, like the workplace and the realm of mass culture, schools have become a device for economic and cultural reproduction. And so what you're seeing all of a sudden is the ability to 
reflect back on schools and see schools as the place where society is really being generated. So what they're seeing in Freire in this book, or what Giroux is seeing anyway, is the opportunity and a language and a set of tools to attack with critical pedagogy schooling in exactly the same way neo-Marxists attacked everything else. In other words, they're seeing the entryway, the real entryway, into creating the counter-hegemonic push that Gramsci would have recommended or did recommend in the prison notebooks into education. So, and Freire, by the way, was also Gramscian in his approach, um, and certainly certainly Giroux was familiar with, with Gramsci. So, what you have to catch here, though, is that Freire planted the idea that education is intrinsically political, teaching is a political act, learning is a political act, and that politics must therefore touch every aspect of education, and in fact, education must touch every aspect of politics, including what the educated will learn, and most importantly, cultural values, and how those will be learned. Um, and for them, what does that mean? It means with the with regard to a Marxian analysis of the way power orders society um, and the need for solidarity against all oppression in that regard. So now you're starting to see, I think, where all of this comes together and how our schools got turned into this Marxist mess. But going forward, we're going to need to understand that while Gottsman refuses to name Freire as the father of critical pedagogy, reserving that title for Giroux, Everything happening in education today, largely because of Giroux, and even in woke theory, which is cultural identity Marxism, has profound Freirean undertones. And what are those undertones? This is what we've got to understand to understand the influence in education and the rise of wokeness. Giroux puts it, again, in the Politics of Education introduction, he says, as a referent for change, education represents both a place within and a particular type of engagement with the dominant society. For Freire, education includes and moves beyond the notion of schooling. Schools represent only one important site where education takes place, where men and women both produce and are a product of specific social and pedagogical relations. Marxism, Marxism, Marxism. Education represents in Freire's view both a struggle for meaning and a struggle over power relations. Its dynamic is forged in the dialectical relation between individuals and groups who live out their lives within a specific historical condition and structural constraints on the one hand and those cultural forms and ideologies that give rise to the contradictions and struggles that define the lived realities of various societies on the other. Education is that terrain where power and politics are given a fundamental expression, since it is where meaning, desire, language, and values engage and respond to the deeper beliefs about the very nature of what it means to be human, to dream, and to name and struggle for a particular future and way of life. As a referent for change, education represents a form of action that emerges from a joining of the languages of critique and possibility. It represents the need for a passionate commitment by educators to make the political more pedagogical, that is, to make critical reflection and action a fundamental part of a social project that not only engages forms of oppression, but also develops a deep and abiding faith in the struggle to humanize life itself. Very Marcusa there. It is the particular nature of the social project that gives Freire's work its theoretical distinction. So that's an awful lot to chew on. But what we see then is that, you know, Freire becomes this figure where education gets completely re-understood in kind of the Marxist mind. Uh, Trying to figure out the right way to put this. So I've I've got this picture in my head that doesn't make any sense, but it's based on this table I have in my living room. And the table, rather than having four legs in the usual way, has four legs that come up kind of like in a pyramid shape and they join at this one spot. And then it has four branches that come out of that. So it looks like from from a profile view, like an X. And if you go around 90 degrees, it looks like an X in the other direction. So you have these four legs that come up, meet at a single point, and then four branches that come up and hold up the table. I hope you can picture that in your head. So if you go back to Gramsci, what Gramsci said is there are five key cultural institutions that hold up society. Maybe he's right, maybe he's wrong, maybe there's more. But he names specifically religion, education, or religion, family, education, media, and law. And so that's like having a five-legged table. 
But in fact, I think the metaphor is better understood in this kind of table in my living room, where you have the four legs are religion, uh, family, media, and law. And then that join is education. Education actually influences all of the other legs that hold up society. So society, in fact, has four pillars, not five. And education is the mediating link between all of them. And what Freire brings to the table as interpreted through Giroux is this understanding, just how central education is to the whole project. So what we need to understand then is what education meant to Freire and how how it becomes like this uh, for him, this, this, I don't know, this, like the join between the pillars of society, the, the, the thing that holds the pillars up and makes them work so they don't wobble. Like if you have a, another picture you could have in your head is just a standard table with like four legs, but, uh, it's got that X it's got those two cross beams that, that stabilize it. So the legs don't wobble and it doesn't tip over. Um, education is like the X that holds it all together. And that's kind of the picture I have. And of course, what he says is the whole point of education is to, uh, to make critical reflection and action a fundamental part of the, of a social project that not only engages forms of oppression, but also develops a deep and abiding faith in the struggle to humanize life itself. In other words, the Mar- the Marxist, uh, or I guess now critical Marxist Feltenschwang, uh, being actualized in critical faith and critical hope. And so it is this particular dimension, the nature of this social project, that gives Freire, Freire's work its theoretical distinction. That's what he's brought to the table. That's why he's the prophet, right? And so what is education for Freire? It's like literally everything. It does. It goes beyond schooling. We just heard that, right? So Freire sees pedagogy as an in, as instrumental to every single part of life, every aspect of life. He has a lot of other books. He has an absurd number of books. And some of the titles are Pedagogy of Freedom, Pedagogy of the Heart, Pedagogy of Commitment, Pedagogy of the City, Pedagogy of Hope, and Pedagogy of Oppression being his most famous. So freedom itself becomes a thing, and it's going to be Marxist liberated freedom, where there's an educational theory in an educational content to it, the heart, commitment, the city, hope, oppression. These are all bases upon which an entire educational theory can be built for Freire. So that is every dimension of life for Freire is a teachable dimension of life. And education, by which he would mean a critical education, is something that happens everywhere and in everything. This is actually, it sounds like it was some weird tangential crap, but this is for, this is the most important thing to understanding woke that, I, that I've come across. The point of a critical education in schools then is to teach children to see critical theory in everything and to extract what Freire called critical moments, which is when you have that aha moment where you suddenly see the power relation that's actually structuring society uh, instead of it being hidden from you. Um, and the idea is that you should, your education should be geared to teaching children to see critical moments everywhere all the time and perpetually having a revolution in their thinking accordingly. So Freire in theory also turns this idea backwards in on itself too at the exact same time. Everything, according to Freire, offers a critical education. The city, the hope, the oppressed, the commitment, whatever, heart. But also a critical education is everything such that the whole point of being in the Freirean faith becomes to continuously awaken to an even more critical understanding of everything. By finding that critical understanding in everything, everywhere, all the time, and applying it to everything, everywhere, all the time. That sounds intense, but everything is constantly supposed to be reinforcing your critical education program. Everything you encounter is a teacher. Everything you encounter is also a student. And so a student and teacher, the, the, the division between those two are to be blurred. And, and Pedagogy of the Oppressed, he talks about how students and teachers have to be dialectically synthesized so that you have students who become like teachers and teachers who become like students. And he says we're going to call them teacher students and student teachers. He really says that in his musical, magical poetry prose. Um, this, in fact, gets so – this turning back inwardness of theory, the self-reflexivity of theory – is key to understanding Freire 
but also that it, it's like literally everything is an educational opportunity and everything is there for a critical moment generating opportunity. So everything is relevant. Critical theory is relevant to everything and everything is relevant to critical theory. And that's really this key point you have to have. But what he's also seeing, remember, everything in the whole universe is education and critical education is the key. And so everything he is, this, he doesn't call it this, Other somebody else calls it this. Well, there's this concept in critical education theory called the hidden curriculum. And uh, Freire taps into this exact same idea, even though he never names it. And it's another very important idea in critical pedagogy. Uh, and what it basically boils down to is um, where you think of, say, the curriculum of a school, let's make it simple, is, say, reading, writing, math, science, history, and so on. And in terms of what you actually teach and how you're going to teach them, what the materials are, that's the curriculum, right? So Freire insisted that schools teach a lot more than that. They actually socialize people as well. Philip Jackson is another critical education theorist from the 60s. Uh, and in 1968, he coined the term for this called the hidden curriculum. So there's a hidden curriculum throughout all of the schools, but for Freire, there's a hidden curriculum in everything in life. Uh, and then there's the critical one that challenges and un, un, it, what is it? What's the word I'm looking for? Unmasks, uh, makes visible the power dynamics and thus the uh, nature, the oppressive and dominant nature of the hidden curriculum. So in 1968, in a book called Life in Classrooms, Philip Jackson, Philip W. Jackson, I think, wrote about the hidden curriculum, and he says it's not explicit. But what it does is it socializes people and it teaches them cultural values, behavioral norms and mores, it teaches them, you know, societal expectations. And so what it does is it reproduces the shape of the domination of the existing society. And Freire is basically saying the same thing is that education in the normal models actually just reproduces the shapes of domination in the existing society. And so what you need is to be able to expose that and to have a completely different radical curriculum that completely gets away from domination of any kind. This, though, from Jackson, not from Freire, is what Giroux refer refers to as the new sociology of education that was arising in the 60s and late 60s in particular. And that's what he was able to, he was already familiar with and grafted Freirean theory onto it when he saw how similar they were and that Freire gave him the answers to the questions he had to where it wasn't working when he tried to put it into practice. And so Giroux used that to popularize Freire in North America. So whether we use that term, hidden curriculum or not, the Freirean point of a truly critical pedagogy is to turn education inside out from every possible angle and to identify and remake the hidden curriculum of everything to make everything a critical education instead of something that reproduces domination. Now you're starting to see that this sounds like wokeness. So in other words, what this is, is to fully redwash education in the schools, but also the way that you see everything else in the world as an educational opportunity, and to install that Gramscian counter-hegemony into the cultural pillar of education or into that hub, that join of the other cultural pillars, and through and through on every possible level in a self-reflexive manner. So this is all absolutely key to understanding both Freirean theory and a solid critical pedagogy, but also all of woke theory, which again I say is cultural identity Marxism. So, for example, you probably will have noticed, people have noticed, people are saying that what wokeness does is it finds something wrong with literally everything, as though it doesn't know how to do anything else to the point of absolute absurdity. You know, everything is problematic. Literally everything is white supremacy. Literally everything is patriarchy. Buildings are penises. Um, hiking is racist. Like literally they find it in literally everything. It sees literally everything in society as possessing, now I'll phrase it this way, a, pe a pedagogical and educational potential for a critical theory inducing moment or a critical moment as, as, as Freire had it. And every bit of that educational or pedagogical potential in everything in life harbors a hidden curriculum that reinforces and remakes the domination of society, what Marcuse referred to as the existing society, which he said is maintained because it keeps reproducing itself. And the only way we can get to liberation, Marcuse had it, and Freire has it the same way. The only way we can get to liberation is if we actually reject the logic of domination completely. So when he looks at Stalin, Marcuse is saying, well, he reproduced the logic of domination by creating bureaucracies. And the logic of domination just kept coming back. This is the poppycock of critical Marxism, is that you're going to get away from this completely. But what's happening here, when you take Freire out all the way to the ends, 
and this is where wokeness comes from, literally everything is an educational moment. Literally everything contains the reproduction of the existing dominant society and domination itself. So literally everything has to be subjected to these critiques of the hidden power dynamics within them. And that's the kaleidoscopic critical consciousness of identity Marxism that we call woke. That's what's going on. So critical Marxism post Freire incorporation into education becomes this ridiculous mishmash where everything anyone can ever possibly imagine has to be called into the, inter- the woke interrogation room for how it allegedly upholds the existing society or racism or sexism or classism or ageism or ableism or fat phobia or transphobia or heteronormativity or any other fucking thing you can imagine and thus prevents the advent of the woke utopia that can only emerge when all of the systems of domination have been exposed and utterly uh, revolutionized. And that's woke, woke praxis. That's woke praxis. The lay term for woke praxis, the lay term for this, the everyday common language for this is constantly bitching about everything. Constantly bitching. Never being satisfied, never being happy, constant mental illness, constant personality disorder. But you have to understand that this is all directed and purposed bitching that is always critically Marxist in its orientation and is always designed to root out so-called power dynamics, but not to correct or satisfy any problem, but instead to engender even more bitching later. As Freire had it, after all, since we're sticking with Freire, and this paraphrases him closely, for the revolution to be authentic, it must be perpetual. For the moment it ceases to be revolutionary, it becomes the status quo. And in fact, Giroux echoes this point that you actually can never stop being revolutionary. If you're going to be Freirean, nothing can ever be still. Gottsman, we heard in an earlier episode, complains about the same thing. Whoops, we've got all this critical. Remember, this is the, one of the first things I, I read from him. We've got all this great stuff happening. We, or maybe it was my Apple in his forward. Uh, we've got all this great stuff happening. All this critical education theory is becoming mainstream, but by being mainstream, it's just it's lost its revolutionary potential. Oh, well, constantly twisting the ratchet for more and more and more perpetual revolution. And Freire is one of the reasons why, because the revolution must be perpetual. But revolution being perpetual means perpetual chaos, which means never getting anywhere, getting anything done. It's a recipe for worse than collapse. And so this is also though why I, I, I continually keep trying to tell people, and I say this over and over again, our schools today are not indoctrinating students into Marxism. That's some old Soviet bullshit that nothing, it is not happening anymore. They are instead programming children to be critical theorists. And this is far, far worse. This is the point of all this shit in the schools is to program your kids to be critical theorists, which is a exquisite, clean, nice way to say people who constantly bitch about everything in a purposed way to dissolve society. What the schools are programming your children into is little bastards who constantly bitch about how everything must be indicative of some kind of power dynamic that is unfair to somebody, probably themselves, for which nobody can take any responsibility except for the people who are tied to it that they can scapegoat. And the whole point is these power dynamics make society suck and would be better if we had a perfect society and a utopia. And all we're going to do is constantly bitch about it. That's the thing that these schools are going to try to turn your children into. This is the theoretical distinction Giroux's talking about and referent for change that he's identifying in Freirian pedagogy so uh, excitedly. The shift from indoctrination to programming in critical theory. The programming is designed to melt society down and induce utter dependency on people like the gurus, like Freire, who get to stand like prophets and tell everyone how it really is. In this case, though, it's not really what's going to happen because there are huge financiers who are pulling all the strings, funding all this shit. Bill and Melinda Gates fund the crap out of woke education. Wonder why? You think Bill and Melinda Gates are going to water down their brains? No, they're going to be the people who get to tell everybody what to do. They're going to be called stakeholders. And the stakeholders are not you as somebody who actually has a stake in what happens in education, but the technocrats who put themselves in power after they melt everybody's brain and they tell everybody what everybody has to do in order to make sure that they're environmentally, socially, and governance compliant. Back to Giroux, though. 
in the politics of education. What is this new sociology of education? He says the new sociology of education emerged in full strength in England and in the United States in the early 1970s as a critical response to what can loosely uh, what can be loosely called the discourse of traditional educational theory and practice. The central question through which it developed is criticism of traditional schooling as well as its own theoretical discourse, which was typically Freirean. How does one make education meaningful in a way that makes it critical and hopefully emancipatory? Remember, emancipatory means emancipation from capitalism, emancipation from oppression, emancipation from reality, the ability to become anti-real and to envision the world as you believe it should be and for that to manifest and be created. But the problem is that everybody has to be on exactly the same page. Good thing there's solidarity. And what's this new sol- this new sociology of education all about? I'm going to read a rather long segment from Giroux here in the introduction because this new sociology of education is what he was able to graft the Freirean stuff into. And this new sociology of education is what we're going to explore actually in the first few chapters of Gottsman if we ever get back to them after we get a Freire here. Um, but the new sociology of education is this new mentality of education um, upon which all of this woke crap ultimately grew, Freire being a very instrumental figure and in making it all super self reflective, etc. Uh, he says, radical critics for the most part agreed that educational traditionalists generally ignored the question and avoided the issue through the paradoxical attempt of depoliticizing the language of schooling while reproducing and legitimating capitalist ideologies, in case you wondered if it's Marxist. The most obvious expression of this approach could be seen in the positive, sorry, positivist discourse used by traditional education theorists. A positivist discourse, in this case, took as its most important concern the mastery of pedagogical techniques, meaning how to teach, and the transmission of knowledge instrumental to the existing society. The the woke education people call this instrumentalist knowledge, and they're super against it. Using schools to teach people how to perform in society is the thing they're against, because it should be radical and transformative and political, etc. So you teach kids fucking useless politics shit and how to constantly bitch instead of how to do things like balance their checkbook, you know, whatever it happens to be. Practical skills to get learn to code. A positive, positive, I can't even say that word right now. A positivist discourse in this case took as its most important concern the mastery of educational techniques and the transmission of knowledge instrumental to the existing society. That's the thing they're saying is bad. These people. In the traditional worldview, schools were considered merely instructional sites. That schools were also cultural and political sites was ignored, as it should have been, as was the notion that they represented areas of contention among different, differently empowered cultural and economic groups. In the discourse of the new sociology of education, traditional education theory suppressed important questions about the relations among knowledge, power, and domination. Furthermore, out of this criticism emerged a new theoretical language and mode of criticism that argued that schools did not provide opportunities in the broad Western humanist tradition for self and social empowerment in the society at large. On the contrary, left critics provided theoretical arguments and enormous amounts of empirical evidence, sus, to to suggest that schools were, in fact, agencies of social, economic, and cultural reproduction. Okay, that's actually probably true, but it's actually probably good. The idea that you would maintain your culture from one generation to the next in a functioning culture seems like a pretty good idea. And the fact that schools that deal with lots of children and teach them how to perform and function in society, instrumental knowledge, seems also like a good idea. The leftists are crackpots. Their problem was that this is a hegemonic force, as they would put it, and that hegemony must be broken down according to Gramsci and Marxist theory, so that they can step in and have a Marxist revolution, which is bad, except they don't know that because they're idiots. At best, he tells us public schooling offered limited individual mobility to members of the working class and other oppressed groups. And in the final analysis, they were powerful instruments for the reproduction of capitalist relations of production and the legitimating ideologies of everyday life. I don't think that that's likely to be as true as he's making out. 
Radical critics within the new sociology of education provided a variety of useful models of analysis to challenge traditional educational ideology. Against the conservative insistence that schools transmitted objective knowledge, radical critics developed theories of the hidden curriculum, as well as theories of ideology that identified the interests underlying specific forms of knowledge, like math being white. Rather than viewing the school, <clears throat> rather than viewing school knowledge as objective, remember how they are really against objectivity? Rather than viewing school knowledge as objective as something to merely be transmitted to students, proponents of the new sociology of education argued that school knowledge was a particular representation of the dominant culture. Math is white one that was constructed through a selective process of emphases and exclusions. That's why we need ethnomathematics, so that we can have different emphases and new inclusions. We need inclusive education. Math is white. Against the claim that schools were only instructional sites, radical critics pointed to the transmission and reproduction of a dominant culture in schools, with its selective ordering and privileging of specific forms of language, <laughs> yes, modes of reasoning, uh, yes, social relations, mm, yes, and cultural forms and experiences, mm, kinda. So these people hate society, as you can tell, and they want to just destroy society. So we're going to, it's apparently bad to privilege specific forms of language, like, say, standard English in a country that is dominant speaking English, modes of reasoning like epistemic adequacy, soundness, validity of arguments, reliance on empiricism, you know, statistical reasoning, etc., mathematical logic, uh, social relations like not beating each other's faces in at school, maybe not going into a girl's bathroom and raping a ninth grader, and cultural forms and experiences. Okay, you can have some flex there, but if you have Taco Tuesday at your school, it's going to be cultural appropriation, so that's a problem. In this view, culture was linked to power and to the imposition of a specific set of ruling class codes and experiences. Moreover, school culture functioned not only to confirm and privilege students from the dominant classes, but also through exclusion and insult to discredit the histories, experiences, and dreams of subordinate groups. I'll just point out that there's these gigantic lawsuits right now because poor, working class, Asian American kids of immigrants are being systematically excluded from the best high schools and universities in the United States because they qualified to get in, but we can't have too many of those damn poor Asian kids getting in because we've got to do exactly what these people are saying, but these are the people that are running the schools. Iron Law of Woke Projection. You know, discredit the histories, experiences, and dreams of subordinate groups. So the kids that come in and talk about their parents escaping, say, the Cultural Revolution in China, you don't really understand real communism. We're going to confirm and privilege students from the dominant classes, but also through exclusion and insult. So Asians don't have personalities, they get low personality scores. Give me a fucking break, you people. Finally, against the assertion made by traditional educators that schools were re relatively neutral institutions, radical critics illuminated the way in which the state, through its selective grants, certification policies, and legal powers, shaped school practice in the interests of capitalist rationality. Hmm. You know, like having uh, set aside scholarships for women now that women get two thirds of college admissions and having specific programs for that, even though that's by far the dominant. Yeah. These people are just frauds. They're just frauds. For the new sociology of education, schools were analyzed primarily within the language of critique and domination. That's why, because they're stupid and they use critique and domination, in other words, Marxism, to understand everything. Since schools were viewed primarily as reproductive in nature, that again is the Marxist view, left critics failed to provide a programmatic discourse through which contrasting hegemonic practices could be established. The agony of the left in this case was that its language of critique offered no hope for teachers, parents, or students to wage a political struggle within the schools themselves. Consequently, the language of critique was subsumed within the discourse of despair. And so that's what that's how Giroux frames out education and why we needed a critical pedagogy based in Freire and critical hope that we're now going to be super positive. So we can summarize here a bit. Freire's work steps into this space of 
discourse of despair within critical Marxism, which w- relies explicitly in its own words on negative thinking uh, and doesn't try to cast a positive image. And then it offers some new hope of Marxian utopian fever dreams. It does this by seeming to offer a pedagogy that is a praxis that can get around the failure point that critical Marxism ran into. Just like Marxism ran into a failure point and then critical theory emerges from that, now we have critical Marxism hitting a failure point and this uh, critical pedagogy arising out of that. And that failure point is that everything in the existing society, according to critical theory, is believed to reproduce the existing society which, as Marcuse had it, flattens the entirety of the existing society into a one-dimensional landscape that we can't break free of. And, of course, a critical consciousness brings you into a second dimension where you now can break free of it. But what that means is you have to become a critical theorist, not to be trapped in a perpetually reproducing society that, according to Marcuse, gives you the good life. It actually delivers the goods, but, you know, it's not Marxist utopia, so it could be way better if we could just ruin this society first and get people to see how crappy that is. Then we could probably get them to want a better, perfect society that couldn't have been ruined in the first place because it's a Marxist utopia. That's literally what we're working with here. So let's remember, though, from previous podcasts, just to summarize a few important points about this failure point thing, Max Horkheimer said in an interview in 1969 same year that Marcuse wrote Essay on Liberation and said similar stuff, but he said specifically in this interview that the reason he created critical theory, which is, as Gottsman has it, critical Marxism, is because the better society cannot even be imagined in the terms of the existing society. The terms that society exists on itself are wholly corrupted. It's not even possible to explain what the good society would look like, he said. He said instead, though, what we can do is criticize everything about the existing society that isn't utopia. Herbert Marcuse, again, same year, talked about how negative thinking is, is, is all they have and that it necessarily becomes positive by allowing relentless critique of everything so that the utopian society he said is contained within the existing society can be set free. And the process is by using relentless critique to strip away all oppression in all of its various forms. But Marcuse, other than saying we need solidarity, we need a biological basis for socialism, we need a new sensibility, uh, he didn't have a, and we need a student movement that cobbles together with the identity politics. He didn't have a working roadmap for doing it. He had all the pieces, but he didn't know how to put them together. Uh, and, And in fact, as it started to kind of evolve or devolve from there, in the late 1970s, he had a pretty famous interview, I think, with Brian McGee or something like this on TV where he decried how anti-intellectual his own movement movement had become. Um, So now we understand the importance, though, and the role of Freire to the woke critical Marxism movement. And woke is critical, I'm sorry, cultural identity Marxism. And that role and importance is that where critical Marxists called out classical Marxism for stabilizing the working class, and that's where it was its critical failure, and then said also that they can't, you can't even understand, like the entirety, the conclusion was the entirety of society reproduces society, it exists to reinforce and reproduce society, necessitating a critical theory that's outside of the traditional theory. This is Horkheimer. Critical Marxism, that's a critical theory, hit its own wall in the pure nihilistic despair of constant negative thinking. So this this is the great refusal of Marcuse. It's just fucking depressing. Freirean theory offered a new hope, critical hope, that if we all become critical theorists in our own ways and link together in solidarity, we can actually get around this new, new insurmountable problem for Marxian theory, achieve the revolution, perpetual revolution, in fact, has to be what it is, and then we can have our utopia, which is a perpetual revolutionary state, and education will be its home. The identity politics that had already been unleashed in the left through Marcuse and the various liberation movements, with its sexual liberation, gay liberation, women's liberation, black liberation, that they the liberation fronts literally in various countries like the Viet Cong and, and Vietnam, uh, the, these all became the model. And the nest egg and Freire's idea kind of growing out of that in the South American context and also out of liberation theology itself um, brought together the idea that all forms of oppression are intrinsically linked. Like I said earlier, this was echoed, of course, by the black feminists in their own context elsewhere. They're probably not aware of Freire when they said it. Uh, and this 
this is where all the necessary ingredients for wokeness were developed. And it was to be developed primarily with an education, which means your children are to be the incubators of this perpetual revolution. And you get into their heads by programming them to be critical theorists who see critical moments in literally everything by teaching them to constantly bitch and complain and think that everything's rooted in power dynamics and that no problem is their fault, but it's somebody's fault and it's really bad. Kind of in light of all this summary, uh, how Giroux puts it again in this introduction, the major difference between Freire's work and the new sociology of education is that the latter, so new sociology of education, appeared to start and end with the logic of political, economic, and cultural reproduction, whereas Freire's analysis begins with the process of production. That is, with the various ways in which human beings construct their own voices and validate their contradictory experiences within specific historical settings and constraints. The reproduction of capitalist rationality and other forms of oppression was only one political and theoretical moment in the process of domination, rather than an all-encompassing aspect of human existence. It was something to be decoded, challenged, and transformed, but only within the ongoing discourse, experiences, and histories of the oppressed themselves. And this shift from the discourse of reproduction and critique to the language of possibility and engagement, Freire draws from other traditions and fashions a more comprehensive and radical pedagogy. So in this regard, we can see the relevance of Freire and laugh about the fact that we haven't even got through the whole introduction to this first book, which is referenced in the first paragraph of the first chapter of the book outlining this whole critical pedagogy series. So we can see the relevance of Freire to the evolution of woke. We can see why in race Marxism, which I hope to have out soon for you, that I say that critical pedagogy provides the plow, planter, and fertilizer that prepares the soil in which wokeness as cultural identity Marxism was able to grow within our society. Kind of starting to wrap this up a little bit in, in the future episode, next episode probably, um, of this in the next in the coming episodes of this podcast series, what we're gonna do is we're gonna have to explore this particular book, The Politics of Education by Freire in 1985, then eventually get through more of the first chapter of the critical turn in education, then eventually turn our attention to kind of the er book of Freire and thought, the pedagogy of the oppressed. I'm not gonna read a bunch of other freaking Freire books. Uh, and we're gonna have to take on pedagogy of the oppressed chapter by chapter. Um but before we go there, it's going to be necessary to finish this introduction and introduce uh, and, and to address, I mean, uh, how more about how it actually reveals how just religious wokeness is or faith-based wokeness is all the way down to its roots and soil in which it's been grown. So I'll probably also have to do some Marxist theology podcast and maybe Marcusean theology podcast. Maybe it'll be one podcast, maybe it'll be two podcasts. I don't know. So we got a lot to cover to even try to start to understand this. The next episode, however, because this is where cutting off kind of here with this introduction for with Giroux's introduction, the next episode takes up with liberation theology, which is really unexpected unless you know that Freire was, you know, kind of pushed into everything that he did because of liberation theology, including being brought to America. Uh, the Catholics, the Marxist Catholics, I really, I should say a Marxist posing as Catholics, especially in South America with their liberation theology, are actually critical to the development of critical pedagogy and wokeness, which, as I've mentioned before, is one of the reasons why I'm skeptical that religion on its own is sufficient to repel communism or wokeness or Marxism, because it infected the living crap out of them and used them to move itself into our society uh, more significantly than almost anything else, whether it's the social gospel of the Baptists, which was a very Fabian project following Walter Rauschenbusch, um, whether that's the liberation theology branch in Catholicism, which is just Marxism posing as Catholicism. But to wrap this episode up before we jump off into other episodes, let's go back to Gottsman and out of this introduction. And so that means we'll also look at Montero Seabirth again from the Harvard Educational Review, if you've forgotten her already, to point out that the context of this book, uh, as opposed to as compared against the pedagogy of the oppressed, um, is that the politics of education published in 1985 was the point at which, like I said earlier, that Freirean education started to be fully incorporated in a North American education in the society. So Gottsman's big point, which I'm going to read to you actually from his book, is that if you under, if you approach Freire as though Freire 1970, stuff that happened in the 1970s was in early 1980s was based off Freire, and then we go forward, you're actually wrong. 
there was a totally parallel critical pedagogy movement emerging in the United States that was rooted in Marxist critique, just like Freire was, but also that was already developing the so-called new sociology of education. And that's separate. And then in 85, with the, pu with the publication of the politics of education, Freire gets grafted onto all this 20 years of architecture that's been building up from Marxist education theorists in the United States who have already had major wins, major, major colonization of our K through 12, 12 education programs throughout the 70s and in the early 80s to where by the early 80s they already had basically enough of a stranglehold. This answers the question I've never been able to figure out. How on earth, until now, uh, how on earth was it that people saw Freire, who in the Pedagogy of the Oppressed cites Marx on like every page, quotes Lenin positively, refers positively to Mao, talks about Castro and says basically he's too weak and we should compare it like look at Che Guevara, he's better because he's not weak. You know, like he's, this is how on earth did any American in the early 1980s or late 1970s read this and then say, yeah, we're putting that in our education system? And the answer is that the Marxists here, the neo-Marxists really here in the United States infiltrating into education had already spent almost 20 years laying all the architecture to where when this thing landed in 1985, they had already largely colonized and produced all of the necessary groundwork to where Freire could easily be grafted on without raising the alarm bells. And so this is a pretty important chunk of history, so we'll read it straight from Gottsman. For a contemporary reader, he says, familiar with a scholarship in critical education studies, which almost always locates the origin of critical educational scholarship in the 1970s, 1970 publication of Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed, the review might be puzzling. Montero Seaworth's comments read as an introduction of Freire to the educational community, 1985 being 15 years later. Quote, now... In the politics of education, she noted, quote, Freire sp sparks further discussion on the major issues in education by bringing his writings before an English-speaking audience. While much of what is said is not new, the particular collection of articles updates Freire's political and pedagogical message for U.S. audiences, end quote. Back to Gottsman. Indeed, the collection of over a dozen loosely connected essays, articles, dialogues, and commentaries consists of uh, work primarily written in the early and mid-1970s, including two articles Freire originally published in Harvard Educational Review. This was not new work. However, as the first of a series of books Freire published in the new Critical Studies in Education series with publisher Bergen and Garvey, which he co-edited with Henry Giroux, the politics of education was clearly intended to launch Freire into educational conversations in the United States. At the time, Freire was marginal in the field. Today, Paulo Freire is invoked, discussed, and cited in a wide range of educational scholarship from literacy education to school reform. Pedagogy of the Oppressed is a mainstay in education across uh, main education courses across the country. I'll just add at this point again, remember, third most cited piece of work in the humanities and social sciences is the pedagogy of the oppressed. Number three, most cited. Number three, most important. And this huge regard. Get back to Gottsman. While John Dewey is likely the most recognized scholar in the field, Paulo Freire is probably not far behind. For radical education scholars in particular, Freire is the touchstone voice. Scholarship espousing social justice is almost always in conversation with his critical educational approach. So we do have to pay a lot of attention to Freire. We have to understand how influential Freire was. We also have to understand that he was being grafted into a huge architecture that had already taken off, historically speaking, in the U.S., and it already had had major wins or else he never would have made it in. However, Gottsman tells us, as this chapter details, there's a strong dissonance between the dominant perception of Freire's role in the history of the turn to critical scholarship in the field, which is one of instigator, if not originator, and the paper trail of evidence that suggests otherwise. In this process of charting an alternative history of Freire's reception in the field, this chapter also demonstrates how the positioning of Freire as the instigator of critical educational scholarship has led to contemporary problems with the way scholars engage his ideas, particularly those articulated in Pedagogy of the Oppressed. As critics such as Rich Gibson have noted, the mere mention of Freire too often substitutes for an engagement with his work, arguably his core theoretical contribution to revolutionary thought, that critical education should be the central feature of a revolutionary movement building 
or sorry, of revolutionary movement building is thus rarely engaged. Critical education should be the central feature of revolutionary movement building is Freire's big contribution. This chapter helps us understand some of the historical reasons why this might be the case and concludes by urging critical education scholars to revisit his work with a close eye to context. And so what this is referring to is Gottsman makes clear at the conclusion that he referenced there in this chapter, first chapter of Critical Turn in Education, Revolutionary Movements, is that Freire's work is insufficiently structured to be properly revolutionary on its own. In other words, while it's powerful, that guru mechanism is just too strong. He's too abstract. He's too theoretical. He's not clear and concrete enough. It would be a mistake, Gottsman warns us, echoing others, to believe that there is a clear straight line from Freire's theory to critical pedagogy as it exists today, and to think that such a line exists is to misunderstand the actual development of critical pedagogy and what critical pedagogy is pretty much entirely. That's why Gottsman credits Giroux, I think like in the fourth chapter, who made Freire applicable and connected him to the so-called European theorists as the father of critical pedagogy. Of course, the European theorists mean critical theorists and also some of the postmodernists. What we will have to understand going forward throughout this whole series then, and if you want to understand critical pedagogy, is therefore unfortunately complicated, but it can be made comprehensible. Freire is a prophet, Jury was the point man. That's the simplest explanation, but you must understand it. Giroux was already steeped deeply in the radical education movement, the critical education movement, and in the European theorists. So this, how did all these things fuse is a big question. Henry Giroux is a gigantic part of the answer. He was already steeped in both radical education, became a huge Freire devotee, like religious convert level, and was already an expert in the critical European theorists, particularly if you read his work, he cites these people over and over again, Herbert Marcuse, Max Horkheimer, uh, Antonio Gramsci, and Jacques Derrida, a postmodernist, not a critical theorist. He was also, when I say a devotee of, Giroux was a devotee of Freire, by his own admission, he's like massively struck, like it's like, I'm, see, I'm like an apostle of the prophet. And he was in this downtrodden state. He felt almost completely defeated in his radical circular pedagogy or whatever he wanted to do uh, until he stumbled upon, I said circular because he wanted all the students to sit in a circle. I don't know what it's actually called. Yeah, everybody's equal. Everybody in the classroom is equal. Uh, um, he was he, he just was having no headway with his radical education program until he stumbled upon Freire. Apparently, he read all of the pedagogy of the oppressed. Somebody gave him a copy, and one night, didn't sleep, came rushing to his principal the next day at the school he was teaching at like a manic lunatic, saying that it, everything had been opened up to him and he wanted to do all this stuff. Then he starts getting like in all this trouble, ends up meeting Freire personally, has this really weird weekend with him. Like, the whole thing. The guy's a total, like religious convert apostle to the to the to the prophet scene so you've got this guy who's already in the critical education movement he's deeply steeped in marcusian theory horkheimer the other critical theorists uh he talks about Derrida or t- talks about adorno sometimes he's deep into gramsci uh by the end of the 70s but he's also familiar with the postmodernists in particular derrida uh he mentions a lot and so then he gets this religious conversion to his guru in Freire and brings all this crap in. And you see the moment is in 1985, in particular with the publication of this book. So in this sense, um, in Freire, we see a particular Marxian theology and a particular belief about education. That the core idea, we just said it a minute ago, critical education should be the central feature of all revolutionary movement building. We see that grafted into and becoming the theoretical underpinning for Giroux to really get critical pedagogy going in North America. And in that sense, there's no understanding Giroux or critical pedagogy without understanding Freire. But to believe that critical pedagogy is just as extension out of Freire is not only to misunderstand what happened, but also to misunderstand what people like Giroux understood as being central to understanding the contribution Freire made, and also to central to what critical praxis and education has to look like. And so what is what does this all have to look like? Well, I don't know. This is a little silly. Perhaps, you know, it's most useful to, to quote J.K. Rowling, I put in mind of this at this point anyway, where uh, she writes as Professor Severus Snape 
talking on the what the dark arts are about and it is I don't know. The quote goes, the dark arts are many, varied, ever changing and eternal. Fighting them is like fighting a many headed monster, which each time a neck is severed, sprouts a head even fiercer and cleverer than before. You're fighting that which is unfixed, mutating, indestructible. Right. And so you could say that critical pedagogy, the point of critical pedagogy is to program our children in these dark arts, I guess. Um, if, Freire had one point that rises up more clearly than any other. Uh, it's that this has to be central to everything, especially as he gets related by Drew. But is that there, there can be no fixed recipe for critical pedagogy. It must always be contextual. It must always change according to the context. And so it's constantly unfixed, mutating, indestructible. But well, I don't know. Maybe that's not the right metaphor. I always think of that. That's like Marxism. Um, it's definitely how Marxism works. I don't know. Uh, the idea, though, that I really wanted to convey by you know, like that, that was there with that is that um, the context for critical pedagogy must always the, the the critical pedagogy that's being employed must resist being taken away or stopped. So it has it can't be identified clearly and stopped. So, for example, if critical race theory is exposed in education, it has to be rebranded as part of culturally responsive teaching or ethnic studies or something. And then you say critical race theory is not there. If queer theory, the gate to hell, is exposed in education, you're just going to have to rebrand it and say it's some part of trauma-informed education to help LGBTQ identity students, blah, blah, blah. And that its objective is the opposite of what it really is, which is grooming kids into not knowing who they are. We heard that in groomer schools too, where Hannah Dyer explicitly says that the point of queer theory is not to create a stable LGBTQ identity, but rather to make sure that no identity is ever stable. If say a direct critical pedagogy approach is identified and called out, now it's going to get tucked within some other program like social emotional learning that disguises it and its purpose while making every aspect of itself even more potent and dangerous. That's where I got this dark arts thing uh, feeling. And so that's that, by the way, is if you go back to groomer schools, I just Raina Dyer's groomer schools too. If we go back to groomer schools three, which is the making of the red guard, you can hear that in that podcast where the social emotional learning is a reproduction of Mao's education thing. So like I said, I don't know, maybe Snape's dark arts is a wrong illusion, but you can see what I was going with. Um, it is definitely correct for Marxian theory overall. It, the, they, Marxian theories are the dark arts, many headed monster, you know, many varied, ever changing and eternal, you know, it, the working class stabilizes itself. So it goes into identity politics Identity politics isn't sufficient. So it goes into complete identity dissolution. And then it has to become that every single thing is a possible site of critical engagement. And there's nothing to do but critically engage. This is the dark arts, man. That's Marxian theory. But maybe a better analogy, now that I think about it, somebody actually said this to me today, and I was struck by it. It was really kind of funny. Uh, it was like, I hadn't thought about this in years. Freirian critical pedagogy is more like the nothing from the never-ending story, if you remember that. And so it, what is the nothing? It's a never, well, I mean, it's it's nothing, but it's like, the void that consumes all, but I, I would put it in you know, critical, critical theory or whatever, what they're programming your kids into in the schools is it being, it, turning them into agents of an endlessly bitching void that consumes everything in culture and turns it rotten. And if you remember the, the story from never ending story, what, what happens is, so it, it's a little dorky, but you know, there's this other land called Fantasia and that's where all the fantasies of people are and the children generate most of them. And there's the Fantasians or whatever they're called, the Fantasians or the people that live there anyway, that are, that are, and when the, the nothing consumes them, it's like killing their dreams. But it, the, the story actually has it that they become, they, the, when the nothing consumes a Fantasian or whatever, it transforms it into the real world, into lies, deceit, and despair. So the nothing, which is like that which turns your dreams into lies, deceit, and despair, is exactly what critical pedagogy is. Uh, so virtually all of North American education, thanks to these Marxist assholes, has been retooled into a, to, to program your children to become agents of the nothing. And if you remember the story of the never-ending story, it's children are the repository of like fantasy and the adults because of their workaday lives have abandoned it and that's what's causing the nothing, etc. And what we have is these adults, these Marxists who have been consumed by the nothing, programming children not to be fantasy agents any longer. 
And so The Nothing is really a pretty good, I mean, go watch the movie again, I guess, or read the the novel uh, that it's based on. It's really a pretty good metaphor for um, for for what critical education is about. That's what critical pedagogy is. Literally every single thing has to be bitched about and turned negative. You can't find a single thing that you're not supposed to find the problematics in. I mean, we got ratioed all to pieces on Twitter, but today, when I, as of this recording today, I saw, you know, one that was really funny where the guy's talking, you know, John Madden just died. He's talking about the Madden football games, reproducing some kind of racist, you know, plantation something or another is the most ridiculous thing ever it's like literally teaching children to turn everything as negative and poisonous as possible and to ruin it for everybody else all your dreams are crap everything you hope for reproduces the existing society it's all negative you just want to grow up and have a job and have kids and have a great life well that's just reproducing the capitalist hegemony marx's view of the family was that the family was produced so that you could just continue to produce more capitalism like so the family has to be abolished that's literally i mean this is a perfect metaphor almost um and where does it all come from well their slogan their article of faith is teaching is a political act so when you hear that that's what they're doing to your kids and who's their prophet it's paulo freire this is their religion the religion of nothing of the nothing of lies deceit and despair And that's what they're doing with your schools. And that's what they're doing to your children. 